2020, <laughs> and it's our last meeting of the year. So, all right, uh, let's go ahead and do the Pledge of Allegiance. Judy, if you'd please display the American flag. You'll join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. Would the city clerk please call the roll? Yes. Councillor is Judith Chandler. Present. John Shada. Here. Julie Wolf. Here. Susan Wolbrook. Here. Steve Bremner. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Nancy Fortune. Present. And tonight I'm having pizza from Savelli's. <laughs> Very good. And Mayor John Graham. Present. And tonight I had a tough burrito from uh, the townhouse and it, it didn't last long. <laughs> as soon as I got home, it was pretty well vaporized. So I hope the rest of you are having a chance to, if you'd like to eat, eat dinner uh, during the meeting, please relax and enjoy yourselves a little bit. Great. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Okay. Um, next item of business is the approval of the agenda. I think you've all seen the agenda. We have a motion to approve. Julie? Move to approve the agenda. Okay, great. We have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a second from Mayor Pro Tem. Okay. All in favor, say aye or raise your hands. If your mouth's full, that's just fine. Okay. All right. Thanks. It passes unanimously. Um, okay, so next item is public consent on non-agenda items. Uh, Judy, do we have we do you do we have anybody who'd like to speak on a, a non-agenda item? Well, if um, at this point I do not have any hands raised, I did have one person who would like to speak on an agenda item, but um, not haven't heard anything from anyone for non-agendized items. So, if anybody in the in the attendee list would like to speak on a non-agendized item, if they can use the raise hand tool, otherwise we'll. Assume nobody wants to speak. Do it. And I don't see anyone raising their hand. So, okay, let's go ahead and move on. The next item is the consent calendar. Tonight we have five items reappointment of Ann Nichols to the Pikes Peak Rural Transportation Authority Citizen Advisory Committee, uh, the Manny Awards Legacy Art Sculpture, the Spirit of Volunteerism. Third item is approval of construction contract for the Becker's Lane project. Fourth item is approval of December 1, 2020 regular meeting minutes. And the fifth item is the approval of a construction management, a construction management services contract with basis partners. Um, uh, I, I would like to move that we approve the consent calendar with the exception of F3 approval of construction contract for Becker's Lane project. I do have some questions about that. Otherwise, I uh, move that we approve the rest of the consent calendar as uh, it is uh, as presented. Second. We have a second from Council Wolf. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay, motion aye. passes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll discuss the um, what was item F3, approval of construction contract for the Becker's Lane project. Uh, Councillor Wolf, or excuse me, Councillor Chandler, you had concerns, so why don't you take the floor? Mayor, you know, can, we, can we bring oh, Dole ahead. over? Can we bring Dole over? Because he's okay. managing that contract. Yeah, that'd be Thank you. yeah okay, let's, that's a good idea. Let's bring Dole okay. over so that he can respond to any questions. So, okay. Um, so I, I have several okay. questions. Right. Um, Councilor Chandler, could you hold off just a second until we get Dole on? So we, oh, want, we want to make sure he can hear everything. Can you hear us, Dole? Sure can. Okay, Dole can hear us now. So uh, Councilor Chandler, you have the floor. So I, I just want to reiterate to anyone who's listening in that this is a 159-page a document, and I'm referring specifically to page 16. Um, 
so I have questions about uh, line 202-00010, removal of trees. Um, we have 14 units. Um, I have several questions. First of all, I was unable to attend the community meetings, the uh, engagement meetings uh, due to schedule conflicts about uh, the trees on Becker's Lane. So this line item says that there will be 14 trees removed for a total of $15,400. So one, uh, I'm, I'm figuring that is $1,100 per tree. Was that what was uh, the consensus of the group uh, community meeting that we were gonna remove 14 old growth trees? That's my first question. Um, to, to, for $15,400. So the price you see there is what the contractor bid and we had nine bids. So I don't know what the other, con other eight contractors bid, but um, that is the price that they looked at those trees and that's what they proposed. And it's not that that was the best price, but their overall price was the lowest price. And then My, and your first I'm point, about, I'm sorry, I cut, cut off. It's about price. It's about what did the community engagement meeting, mm -hmm. uh, was it uh, in agreement that there was going to be 14 old growth trees removed from the Becker's Lane Bridge project? Yes. Is that what consensus in the community meeting. Correct. Um, so moving on, on to 212-001003 tree retention and protection, uh, a, a unit of one for $11,858, almost $12,000. We're, re we're, we're retaining one old growth tree for $12,000. Is that my understanding? <laughs> Uh, yes, that's how, that's how, that's what the plans are asking for. It's to protect the giant cottonwoods on the west side of Becker's. Well, it, there's only one unit. And so, so. Well, it's lump sum. Well, forgive me for being a freshman, but you know, I'm, I'm retained by the, 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 the citizens of Manitou Springs to go through line item on these contracts. And I, and I have, I've spent four hours looking at this contract. And I want to know what a line item of one versus 14 trees that we're removing, a line item of one for preserving one, it says one unit of tree protection. How many trees does that mean how, that we're preserving? So all the other ones. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No, but, I mean, I, I mean, basically, basically we have to quantify and measure everything in the project. Yes. And that pay item, that lump sum pay item, represents the way the plans communicated to protect all of the other trees. And I think, I think one of those includes, and the scope includes it, you know, in the plans. And of course, you are only looking through a small window. You know, you don't have the plan sheets in front of you that communicate the scope of that pay item. Um, but, but based on what the consensus for the community was, we wrote that pay item to reflect that those those 14 trees get removed and then everything else gets protected um, accordingly. So uh, so what you're saying to me, uh, I'm not fully understanding this. So on the uh, removal of trees, we have 14 units at a cost of $15,400 or $1,100 per unit. But what you're saying to me is that the tree retention is one unit, but it involves more than one tree. So I, I so how do you communicate to me what 14 units means? Does that mean more than 14 trees are removed? Uh, I, I want some real clarity so I can really wrap my head around this. So please explain that to me. Sure. So the 14 units are each. That allows us to identify which trees that the plans, you know, the plans identified which trees to be removed. And it's 14 of them and it's very specific on the plan sheets. Um, I was trying to pull those plan sheets up and I could even tell you perhaps what the specification is for the tree removal or the tree protection. Um, but the tree protection is basically to, um, on, on one case, they're having to put fence around the trees to protect them so that nothing incidentally gets near them. 
Um, and then it's also for the duration of the project. So part of that pay item there represents that they have to protect those trees for the whole duration of the project. It's not just, you know, like one time. So, so just for clarification, uh, I want to make sure that the 14 units means 14 trees and the tree retention means one Correct. unit equals one tree. So Correct. we are protecting one old growth tree for almost $12,000 versus we're removing 14 trees at $1,100. What I'm saying is obviously it, it would motivate me if I um, uh, receive my income from the city um, to want to take down trees because it's only $1,100 to remove a tree but almost $12,000 to save one tree. So I think the confusion here is that that's 14 each. So each one of those trees, and we have them clearly identified on the plan sheets. We have it by station, which the project will set up a stationing on the, the, the contract will come up and set stationing on the project. And then we actually have it offset from the center line of the project. So we like here's, here's one tree that gets removed to station 15 plus zero three, 26 feet off offset right. So we are very specific about which trees and those are the same trees that we did the, the more colorful graphics that we use when we, when we presented that information um, to the public. We don't expect people to be able to read black and white plan sheets, it can get confusing. So those are the ones we did the yellow dots and you know, brought a lot of emphasis to. The other, the other nuance that you're they're kidding on is that's a lump sum item. That's not an each item. So the way lump sum items work is the project is allowed to communicate a scope and it could be, I could, it could be anything. Um, and in this case, it says protect all the other trees, all of these things, lay this fencing down for the duration of the project. So it's, so it's one lump sum, but, but until you were to read and if I can find it fast enough, I can try to read it for you. Um, but that represents everything else. It's not just one tree. If that item was one each, then it would be that way. But how, but how do I know that? I guess, I guess my question the to you is- The contractor does. Oh, the contractor. So, so, so I should talk to the contractor about what that means because I guess what I'm saying is, and, and, and I'm not really trying to, you know, throw your feet to the fire is that um, I, I, I've been, I've been uh, voted in by the, the, by the citizens of Manitou. And um, you're telling me two different things that 14 units equals one tree, but that the tree retention of one unit means how many trees? I want to know how many trees that means because I feel like there's uh, a lot of um, gray area that's created to make city council members like myself go, "Oh yeah, let's let's just you know let's just uh, uh, you know approve this contract." When I don't know what you're talking about, and I want I, my job is to understand fully what you're talking about so that I can understand what one $11,858 unit means. Okay, so, so you'd like to know which trees are being protected? Yeah. Uh, you know, but, but, but you said on the 14, that was 14 trees. So when I'm, when I'm reading the contract at home, I mean, I don't have your brain to, to pick. So I'm reading a contract that I'm supposed to approve and one unit doesn't necessarily mean one unit, where 14 units means 14 trees. And uh, that's disturbing to me. Well, um, the, again, it, the nuance there, and it's important, is that it's, it's LS, which, which means lump sum. And so in the project, we went through and identified the rest of the trees and they and the, the language that those plans use is um, items or plans to, I'm trying to pull it back up, um, trees to remain. And I can tell you this, I can, this is truth. This is a very tough part of this project. In fact, this project would have probably been advertised months prior 
except for some of the concerns and challenges over those tree removal. I can guarantee you that we did our absolute best to represent what the community wanted in doing the final plan set. Now, the, the nuance you've picked up on is because the lump sum item, although it's just one, it's all encompassing because it doesn't actually cost very much to protect a tree. They just have to do a little work up front. It costs a lot to pull out those old growth Siberian elms. They're big, right. large trees. But you know what? Telling me though, so Joel, because I don't have your mastermind and I am just a elected official trying to represent my community. I feel like you've represented it as the other way around that you have 14 units to remove a tree at a cost of 15,400 or $1,100 per tree versus saving one unit of tree at 11,858. So on paper, it looks to me like, oh my God, if we're talking about 14 trees on this line and we're only talking about one tree on this line, I, what I need to tell my community that I understand this contract is I understand what a unit is because what you're telling me, Dole, and I totally respect you. I, I mean, I, I, I appreciate every effort you put into this, but if you're saying on one line, it's 14 equals one tree, but this one unit equals, I don't know how many trees, but you're not willing to tell me or can't tell me, I need to know that before I move forward on this contract. And then there, I have another additional landscaping question that segues into that, which I have the same problem with. So uh, I, I, I want to know how many trees we're saving for $12,000. So I can go to the Manatee community and go, I voted to save X amount of trees for $12,000. I don't wanna to go to the Manitou community and say, I don't know what you one unit means. So please be clear. I, I just need some clarity on this. Thank you. Councilor Chandler, if, if, if we may. Uh, Denise, you have your hand up. Perhaps so Denise can. I, I believe that you're, what I'm here, what I just heard is that on the west side, you're saving all those trees. And on the east side, it's three trees that are being saved. So, and that was in the conversation. Um, and the plans, I believe, have that. Is that correct, Dole? So I was trying explains. to pull up. I was trying yeah. to pull up some of the graphics that we created for the public meeting because those are that's those are much more colorful. Yeah, and just for the community that's weighing in tonight, those graphics aren't on this 159-page contract, so I can't look at it. So otherwise, that otherwise I would perhaps not be making this noise. Well, and that brings up a good point. And and really, this is the contract between. Manitou Springs and the contractor. These are the legal binding agreements between Manitou Springs and the contractor. And so the, those, those graphics are really for public information and are not part of the, of the plans. They're really for the community to understand what we're doing, to be better, have better clarity. And so um, we would probably not ever include at this point, that type of graphic. This was, this was really what we think represented what the public agreed to, because it, it's a compromise, right? We all can agree that this was a compromise. A lot of people didn't want any trees cut down and a lot of people wanted the whole corridor, all the trees cut down and everything lit up and really bright. So we had to balance both extremes to get this very small, you know, uh, deficient bridge replaced. Right. And, so, and I, I know that Dole, and in the future, I think we should very much weight votes to the people that actually live in the community that we're, trying to make the, you know, because we have all these people weighing in, but there are people that don't even live there. So yes, of course, I, I you know, I want, I want all sorts of things in a community I don't live in, but my, my job, my, I feel like my job as an elected official is to be able to tell the residents of Manitou Springs, the voting people that put me in office, that I understood this contract to mean this. And I, have not gotten that clarity from you. So does one unit equal one or does so, it different for either, every line? If it's different from every for every line, I've got a really serious problem for this contract because 
um, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to look at this 159 page contract and go, I, you know, I know what a pipe is. I know what a, I know what conduit is. I know what a curb and a gutter is, but when you start putting these things together and sneaking them in there as one unit equals this, I have some serious concerns about that. So I want to know what my question is, if we're going to retain trees for the cost of almost $12,000, how many trees are we retaining for $12,000 on Becker's Lane? I believe Kelsey, it's, I believe it's ahead, three Denise. doll. I believe it's three no. doll. Can, it's three. three yeah. So on the east side. Yeah. Councilor Chandler, if I may, in that in that right, breakdown in the third column, you'll see a the third column's titled unit, and it shows the the basis, the way they uh, the engineers uh, tried to figure out the prices on these various costs, and in some cases you'll see the unit is each. I believe that's what we're showing for the fourteen trees. So there we're putting a price per per each tree. Uh, as you go above it, you'll see an LS for lump sum. I think you've got uh, square yards there. Sometimes they're charging by the hour, sometimes by the day. So there's right. kind of a little decoder ring effect in there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, and so you're asking me as an elective official to, to walk into muck because I'm not, I'm not a contractor, but I've done my best to read this thing. I've read this thing four times. And so I want to make clear that so and this is not just for me, it's for all council members that when we're presenting a con when we're presented with a contract. That we understand the contract and I don't understand the contract so what i'm hearing one of you say is it's one unit equals three trees and on i'm hearing Dole say on the another line one unit equals one tree. And so which one is it? Because we are, um, this, is, this is a multi-million dollar contract. And I wanna make sure that when I put my head on my pillow at night, that I, um, I didn't allow something to sneak by that missed, my, missed me. And so, I, you know, um, you know we, we talk about drought and we talk about the environment and we talk about being a Tree City USA I'm asking you as a city to inform me, does one unit equal one or does one unit equal three or is it different on each line? How do so, I contract? So two pieces of information I have for you that you're gonna find fascinating. So we did get nine bidders on this project, okay? So I pulled up the bid summary and um, for that tree protection or tree retention and protection pay item, okay? We had bids, we had $1,600 bids, $1,200 bids, $600 bids, $5,000 bids, $11,000 bids, $6,000 bids. And then this contractor who is the low bid overall, we actually, we actually had someone at 20,000. And then, and then of course, Native Sun was at 11,000 or whatever their number was. So we are not in control of the individual item. That is what the contractor thinks is how much time and materials and effort he's gonna need to do what the plans need him to do for the tree protection, okay? Now, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go reverse here for a second just to, just to do this. So we could have said, we could have said tree removal and identified the nine trees and said tree removal lump sum. And the contractor would have known that all of those trees get removed by that one pay atom, that lump sum pay atom. Now, by definition, a lump sum pay atom has to only be, you can't pay like two lump sums. It's only ever up to one lump sum. So whenever you create a lump sum item, you have to be very careful that you have correctly qualified and quantified what you're asking the contractor to do. Typically- well, Is it nine trees or trees well, then? This is for the removal, That's not the keeping. Okay. I'm just giving you the opposite example. We could have then done what you're suggesting. We could have said, okay, save, save tree each and we could have gone through and counted each tree that's being saved and we could have done each and each if we wanted to or each in lump sum the reason why it was set up this way was because we wanted to clearly communicate that these nine trees are being removed and we're going to be able to go out there and count them from, the, from when we go out on site and we count the project we can go and count yes there are nine trees that were removed and we can go and pay 
for those each pay items. So it's nine times whatever that price is. So I, is I'm it saying nine? I'm sorry. Is it nine remember. trees that are being removed or 14? whatever the plans say? I, I, I'm afraid that I don't remember the number of trees. Okay. Being, there, are four, there are 14 units listed. So that's in the 14 trees. Okay. So that's 14 trees. So why isn't it three trees on the tree retention? I, you know, you, you, I want transparency and I want to work with you, but you're asking me as a council person to assume that I know in my brain when one equals one and one equals three. I want one to equal one in all well, contracts. <coughs> How, because of can I go? How can I vote for something when I don't know what the hell it means? I mean, if I we make uh, the mayor pro tem had her hand up too, so I'd like to be able to recognize her and have she may have some insight into how this was done as well. Um, no, just Judith. It's a unit of measure, and as as the mayor said earlier, it's um, typical contractual language when you're trying to estimate cost. So lump sum in this case is a unit of measure. And I think Dole did a good job of explaining that in this case, the unit of measure is a number of trees. It, it's right. Also, I would say that in the, right. um, if you go to the website, I believe Dole, all the briefings that were given to the public are still on the website, correct? Yes, yes, they we, are, we, we are, it and posted it. They are, which is why I'm having this conversation because I totally agree with you, Mayor Pro Tem Fortune, that one unit equals one tree. So on 202-00010, removal of tree number 14, any, any educated or reasonable person would say that means 14 trees. But on the tree retention, there is a unit of one for almost $12,000, which would lead me to believe either, wow, we have one really special tree I, I understand, but, right. but back a second, because the unit of measure could be an each, as in one tree, it could be a box, it could be a pallet of boxes. You've heard of, you've heard when people make mistakes when they order things that they meant, you know, one, one package of toilet paper and they end up with 300 packages of toilet paper well, because, you know, they, they ordered one pallet instead of right. one so that's the difference between the unit of measure in this case is. I, well, and I also, I can also weigh in on this and here's, here's why we did it this way. Okay. Because the plans are very specific that they, I mean, I, I could pull up the, the project specification and I, I just was looking at it, but basically we talk about tree protection. We talk about um, not damaging adjacent trees. The reason why we did the nomenclature the way you're referring to is because it covers everything else. If we were to make a mistake and miss, let's say that we said, okay, cut down 14 and save seven. Let's say that we made a mistake and there were actually eight trees to save, okay? What happens to that eighth tree? It's an, un, it's an undefined item in the plants. The reason why we focused on the removal and then we are protecting everything else. The, the contractor is not, here, here's the deal. This is, I think this goes to your point. Go ahead, go ahead and ask me what happens if the contractor cuts down a 15th tree. We have well, a major problem. Yes, One, we did. Yes, we have a major problem because that was not what was agreed to. Two. And we, and we should have a major problem if the citizens of Manitou have agreed we should have a problem, yep, Joel. Yep, I right? totally agree with you. But, right? but, but think about this from the contractor's perspective. One, they are violating the contract. Two, they won't get paid for that work. There is not a contractor in this city that wants to cut down a 50 foot tall tree for free. That thing, that thing, those trees weigh 25 tons. I don't even know, right? They won't get paid for that work. They will be in violation of the contract and they're subject to all kinds of penalties. Right. right. And like the gardens, once it's gone, once an old growth tree is gone, it's gone. It's well, gone, let, which let is why add, we had to negotiate with the community. Uh, well, then let me add this into the mix to make sure that we are up to name. You, you have on 214-00011, um, you have a line item for landscaping, one unit, 
$28,876. How do I go back to the community and say, well, on this line, one equals one, but landscaping, 28, almost $29,000. What does that mean to me? Does it mean that you're replacing these trees? What are you replacing them with? Uh, and this is the problem that I have with the city at large, writ large, is that we go, oh, you know, this, 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 this d developer is going to do this. And then they don't. And we go, oh, you know what? It was just a conceptual drawing. So um, it, this is also on page 16. Uh, of 159, where you have a lump sum for landscaping, but how do I go to the citizens of Manitou and say, well, we removed 14 trees, we saved somewhere in the neighborhood of one to three, I don't even know, I don't even know by this contract, but we have almost $29,000 worth of landscaping, but I don't know what that means either. Does that, what does that mean to me? Hey, Council Chandler, so, several other people also want to speak to these these points. I think they may be able to interject comments uh, that would be useful at this point. Um, right. Denise had her hand up and then Mr. Parker. So if it's all right, let's let's uh, get their take on, on these things. They, this may be a, a timely point to consider. Denise? These are some great questions. Can't hear you, Denise. I'm sorry, let's go to Mr. Parker and Denise, if maybe you can figure it out. Yeah, um, I wanted to comment. I think one of the issues that council member Chandler may be having is that we don't have the full plans and specifications um, attached as an exhibit to the contract that I'm seeing on the packet that I have. And so we have like what's called like a bid sheet, which is generally just part of all the documents that a contractor will submit um, in response to um, an RFP, and typically we'd have um, reference to the RFP and all the other documents, including plans and specifications that are would be referenced as part of the contract and exhibit. And then you would generally see all the details about what those line items you're looking at in the bid sheet represent. So I think when you're just looking at this bid sheet with just lines in it, I understand it would you can't tell what it's about. You can just tell what the price is and generally what it covers. And so I think that Dole has been looking at like the actual plans and specs when he's been trying to respond to you. And so I think from what you read, you can't tell what anything represents. Um, and so what I would recommend we do is generally um, include all the RFP documents, the plans and specs, you know, um, as part of the quote scope of services that's part of the contract. And if that was all attached and provided to you, you, you probably wouldn't have these questions. Yeah. Denise, can Denise, I see your mouth moving, but I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're real soft. Okay, I'll try to speak up so you can at least hear me. Could I ask, can we take a quick five minute break? I need to talk to, Ro to Dole real quick to make sure and then we'll come back with the exact answer that Judith is asking for, because I think she's asking for the exact number of trees and make sure that we have that. So could we just take a five minute break real quick? Yeah, okay, five minute break. So let's say 642. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Ms. Chandler, to your point, when you, when you highlighted that that one pay item, I, I think if it's called landscaping, um, it's just called landscaping lump sum, okay? And, and you were wondering what the $28,000 was going for. So this is one plan sheet of 104 that the contractor bid. This is specific to the landscaping plan and this shows all of the deciduous trees, the shrubs, the ornamental grouses, it gives their Latin name, the size, and it gives the design of them and it shows where they all go. So when the contractor bid that, that item 214-00011 landscaping, he was bidding to not only purchase all of these trees but to also and shrubs and grasses, but also to install them per this exact location of these drawings. And the, you know, the trees are designed that when they reach full canopy that they will not be in conflict with each other. And then the one thing I wanna highlight on this plan sheet as well is we have identified there um, 
those trees that are to be protected. And you can't, the font may not be very big and I know Judy's screen is small, um, but those are, the, those are the trees that to be protected and those are the trees that are included in the protection for that other lump sum item. So I have a question for you. Um, as anyone who knows anything about trees knows that one small tree doesn't equal an old growth tree. So it was my understanding that in a community meeting that there was an agreement that 10 trees would be removed, not 14, and that trees would be uh, uh, replaced. Um, and that I am assuming is under landscaping to the tune of almost $29,000. My concern is that um, I can't feel good about this if I don't know what the landscaping plan is for $29,000 to replace the 10 trees, not 14 trees that needed to be removed so that we could um, bury power lines and put in more concrete sidewalk. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm confused here because on one line item, 214-00011, um, we have landscaping for 28,876, but it doesn't tell us what landscaping, what that means. And, and I, 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 I don't feel good about this as I don't feel good about most projects in Manitou that I think we need to rethink um, how we approach it and say, well, we can't just say, one equals one on this line item, but we're gonna give you a lump sum bid on some kind of landscaping to replace it when I don't know what that is. So can you, are you able to see, is, can everyone see Judy's screen? So no. it's, I, I can't do that math fast enough, but that lump sum landscaping item includes um, 17 trees, 25 shrubs. I'm gonna, I can't do the math fast enough, maybe 150 shrubs, 20 perennials um, or 200 perennials. What size are those, are those trees though? Are we, are we replacing four inch, like that four inch? Four, four inch? inch caliper, yeah. Four inch caliper, okay. So we're replacing 10 old growth canopy trees or 14, depending on how you uh, 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 want to assume this contract reads with four inch caliper trees that will take 30 years plus to grow. Is that what I'm hearing you say? That's correct. We, when we spoke to the tree expert, they actually don't recommend replanting a tree that is too big that there's a sweet spot for trees. And since this is actually near the creek, as you know, the air is colder for the majority oh, of the year. There and is a so, trees. That's yes. exactly I'm having this conversation with you because if we don't get our shit together, and I will say shit together, and stop taking out 10 to 14 or so or old growth trees and replacing them with four inch trees that will not mature <laughs> in my lifetime, we have to take a look at where we are here. And so first of all, so with regards to the contract, um, I want one unit to equal one unit. So if I'm talking about a pipe or I'm talking about concrete or I'm talking about a tree, I want one unit to equal one unit on each line item. And um, so apparently the tree don't meet that criteria for me. And also on the landscaping, it just uh, has, a, has a blanket number of $29,000. I wanna know exactly what that means and what the community can, can, can expect from the landscaping plan that will uh, mature when most of us on this city council are dead. So um, th that's my input here that I, I just think that we have to go moving forward with any contract, not just this one, um, that we have to decide what a unit is, where we are, are we sliding in three more trees we're taking out when the community said 10 trees and now there's 14 units. If, if one unit equals one unit on, on the removal of the tree, but one unit equals three on another line, does 
14 times three equally. Uh, so, so I just feel like, um, I feel like I am really kept in the dark and asked to accept a contract that doesn't make complete sense to me. And Could I say something, Mayor? Uh, yes, Mayor Pro Tem. And I'm sorry, I can't see everybody. So I yeah. don't know if other people are trying to talk or not. Um, I, I would like to get a feel for where the rest of council is. I, um, I believe that due diligence has been done on this contract. And I think that there are, I think Councillor Chandler and no disrespect here, just contracts are difficult. And um, you know, the unit of measure, I think there's a, a misunderstanding on that, that some sitting down with Dole might be helpful as opposed to uh, doing it here. So I would like to get a feel for where the rest of council is on this contract. Because uh, I would like to get some movement on it, one way or the other. Well, I would just I'll just uh, call on each council person and and try to we'll get a reading of the the uh, council's temperature, see see how much further discussion might be required, or if we're ready to to make a motion. Um, uh, Councilman Bremner. Okay, um, I my feelings are in line with. Uh, Nancy's. I'm. Um, I think that our city uh, has done due diligence. I think it's. Uh, I don't think it's our place in city council to nitpick and you know get into the m minor details and you know second guess everything. And I'm. I'm happy with with what the the city's done. So that's okay. where I stand. Uh, Councilman Shada, what's your thoughts? Um, well, I guess I'm happy with the fact that Cole is saying that all the trees on the west side are going to be retained. John, John, you're really hard to hear. And I can understand how possibly. Um, just John, Councilman Shetty, it's hard to understand you what you're saying. But Mr. Um, Shade, I didn't understand what you said. You're oh, you're coming over kind of garbled. No, there's still some rever uh, reverberation. I guess I'll have to call back in then. Okay. Well, okay. Good. Just quickly, John. Do you want more discussion or are you about ready to move on this? I have some questions on the lighting. I think I am happy with the answers on the trees at this point. Okay, all right, let's let's uh, let's go on. Uh, Councilor Woolbrook. Um, I, I think um, what I'd like to know if we waited until the new year and everybody had a chance to look at this, with, what are the consequences? Maybe Dole can answer that. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm fine to move forward with this because these are the details in the contract. Um, and I feel like they've been vetted by city staff, but also it seems like there's a lot of questions here tonight. And I don't know if waiting until the first meeting in January is gonna be a problem. Give Dole a chance to respond to that here in a minute. Uh, Councillor Wolf, what's your thoughts? Um, that was exactly my same question, what Susan just asked. I wanted to know if there's any huge downside to delaying because I believe the public is entitled to know information that is just now being presented to us in microprint. <laughs> So, and, and because there's so much painful history in Manitou, painful recent history around trees being cut down without proper notice, without proper input, without proper consideration of whether it's necessary and so forth, we all know the nightmares uh, because so it's, it's a sensitive issue. So if we were to go ahead and just, you know, push this through, even though we really don't know how many trees are being removed and and, and, and other important things that um, about the trees that tend to be very important to our public and we just approve it, then, you know, I think we're not doing our job. 
On the other hand, you know, if it's going to be a $10,000 a day penalty for not getting started or something, you know, maybe we should take that into consideration too. But I, as the as the attorney said, this should have been provided. It wasn't provided. Let's provide it. Let's just push this out. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, if I could, uh, I think you, you indicated you were ready to move on this. Um, yeah, I mean, I could, um, you know, I'm, I'm counting and I've got Steve and myself are, are ready to move forward. Julie and Susan would like to know if it would be um, feasible to wait. Um, John, ha John Shada has some questions on light. So we don't have, you know, it's a pretty mixed bag at this point of where people are. So I think getting um, Dole's opinion on if there, if it is prudent to wait on it or not, if it's prudent, if it's feasible to wait or not would be useful for folks. Okay, that's the next question then. Mayor, uh, can I say uh, something? Okay, Denise, yeah. Um, if we can, we can pull Karen over. We have done already the public, um, uh, we've gone through the public process. So I think there were two or three meetings with the public and they went through, I attended them. They did go through the landscaping and exactly what was, what was gonna be presented. And I do um, believe our, um, Mary Ellen was part of all those meetings who agreed to that, but let me pull Karen over who may be able to provide a little background on the public process for this, if that's okay, and it will only take a few minutes. Okay, then we'll... In, in, the, in the interim, I would just like to respond to um, Councillor Bremner's uh, comment about getting into the dirt of contracts. Um, I am beginning to learn in my first year on council that I, that is exactly my job, is to get into the dirt about contracts because if we don't, then we vote to pass them. And after the fact, we go, oh my gosh, what did I pass? I didn't realize. And I'm beginning to realize that one of my most important job is to slog through these contracts and take a look at and make sure that this is exactly what the citizens of Manitou wanted us to do. And I just wanna say that, um, that that is why I'm bringing this up. Um, this is a 159 page contract and um, it's easy to just go, oh my gosh, it's too many pages. I just wanna vote for, it. I wanted to get it off my plate, but that's not what I'm here for. And so, um, if, if we have to slog through a couple of, of these things, um, if, if we don't, if, if, if it's, um, if getting through the dirt is too much for us, then why does city council exist would be my question. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really grateful for the rest of the council's input, but um, uh, this Im uh, certainly impacts all of Manitou, certainly my neighborhood. And I am beginning to learn the hard lesson of boy, I'm really okay with this project as long as it's not in my neighborhood, as long as it doesn't cause my light pollution or my uh, traffic problem. Um, and so we need to stop that. We need to come together as a community and say we are a whole entire city of Manitou and look at these projects as they impact the city at large. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Okay. If I could say something to that, um, I, you know, half of this is in my ward. So uh, I, I think um, I've also reviewed the contract. I also went, was able to go to one of the community meetings. I could not go to both of them. Um, I reviewed all the stuff on the webpage that was presented to the community. Um, so I think that I not only have staff done their due diligence, I feel that I've done my due diligence and I trust the rest of council has as well. I think what might be useful is, um, if at all possible, and I know sometimes it's very hard to get to this before, you know, much before the meeting, but if, if the questions are, if we can raise the questions to staff before the council meeting, a lot of misunderstandings or lack of clarity might be cleared up and we don't need to spend an hour on something that we anticipated was going to be a consent calendar item. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Karen? Are you there? I would like to respond to that. Because no, 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 you've talked enough for now. It's time for Karen to speak and then Dole will speak and then we'll get back to council. Karen. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, yes, I was uh, very involved in this project, um, kind of coordinating the public involvement aspect of the project and Dole was really on the engineering side. 
of the project. And so we um, just to backtrack a little bit, we did engage an arborist to evaluate the trees on the east side of the roadway. And um, so he concluded that the trees are in okay health now, but because their crowns have been, were so severely pruned that um, it would, he assessed it would cause problems in the future um, where branches would be weakened. And because of the cross section of the roadway, it, it was not possible to keep these trees because we just were not able to expand the right of way at all to include them. And so I do, I do have the concept plan if that would be helpful to share. Would you, would you like me to bring that up? Yes, please. Okay, let's see here. Bear with me a moment here. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Going to I'm going to grab the screen. So um, can, can you see this plan? Yes. So this, this as you recall, we, um, the trees were a concern at the September community meeting. And so um, we, we also had some technical issues with the meeting, people joining the meeting. And so we, we planned a second meeting on October 15th. And yeah, in the interim, we did engage the arborist. And so he evaluated all of these trees on the east side of the roadway. And so I was just reviewing his report. He noted uh, 10 existing trees in this northern area towards, towards the intersection with El Paso and five in the southern area. And so this is the proposed landscape plan. And so th there's, there are three existing trees, elms that will be protected in the southern area. Um, they, we wanted to do a one for one replacement. We couldn't fit all the trees in this area. So thus we uh, added some others along the trail here. Um, and we did, um, between meetings, we did reach out to members of the garden club, uh, Mary Ellen Montgomery, Melody Dougherty, um, were very helpful. Um, yeah, Mary Ellen um, engaged with us in the landscape architect and uh, strongly supported, uh, endorsed the species that were selected for this area. Karen, didn't um, Melody also participate in the, to make sure there were some pollinator items here and included in the landscaping, was that correct? That's correct, that's correct, yes, yes. So yeah, we will have, you know, some dense understory uh, below, below the trees in this area. Yeah, I, th I think we've learned that our, our citizens don't always want like, you know, a really pristine looking landscape that they, you know, like to have kind of these layers and some depth you know, a little, a little bit more of a death row look to it. Um, so I, I think that's kind of where we arrived at this meeting. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, does, does anybody have a good question for Karen at this point? Well, she's got this graphic up. And I'm afraid I, am, I can't see everyone, so. I have a question. Uh, okay, Julie, yeah, if you would thank go ahead. You. Thank you. Um, so Karen, um, I don't know if I should, I don't know who to ask uh, this question to. Um, so um, does the contract incorporate by reference this specific drawing? Is it a requirement or is it just another one of those things like somebody mentioned earlier where, you know, the citizens get mad at city council because we approve something and we say, oh, I didn't realize it was just a proposal that was presented at a, one of the many community engagement meetings, but it wasn't like a legal requirement. So is this a legal requirement? Um, you know, I think I'd have to defer to 
doctoral on this one, but, but this is the concept that we, we agreed on. Yeah, I understand it, but I'm not interested in concepts. I don't care about concepts right now. My I mean, it's lovely. It's a nice concept. It's pretty, uh, whatever. I want to know if this is a legally incorporated by reference part of the contract. I guess that's a Jeff Parker question. Yeah, no, I appreciate that question. So, uh, the only contract that I see is the version that's on in the packet that you reviewed. And I know um, Councilmember Chandler referred to a 159 page contract. So I don't have that version. My recommendation is after reviewing this is that, is that we should be referencing the plans and the specifications, the requirements um, in the RFP and any documents we think are important to basically um, describe the scope of services and what's occurring. The version on in the council packet that I, I'm reviewing doesn't do that. So the city council wants to approve it. I would recommend they approve it with um, the direction to me to make, make some revisions to the contract to include um, the details and, this, and the specifications that would include information like this. Thank you. Okay, then I'm ready to make a motion. We also had the question as to, we wanted to get Dole's opinion as to whether deferring this would uh, oh. cause us hardship. So why can we get that out? I think that would help inform our decision. Yes, so, uh, very much. so Dole, you have the floor and the question is, if we were to defer this, how much of a hardship does that present for everybody, for the city mainly? Um, so tip, I'll, I'll, to, to Jeff Parker's point, usually in the exhibit, exhibit A, we will reference in the plans and the specifications by reference of the contractor bid. So that, that's usually how we do that. And it looks like here it says just the bid and not necessarily this, the plans and specs. Um, fortunately, I think that this is the best time of the year to delay a project for two weeks, if that's so what everyone decides to do. Um, the contractor was planning on getting potentially the notice to proceed this week if this contract got signed and then they would start to get mobilized stuff materials ordered subcontracts authored and then they were going to start january 4th so um if if we choose to delay approving this that just delays their starting date by however many days that is but there's there's no penalty there's no consequence except for delaying them getting started So Dole, the, the next date is like July or January. I can't remember the date of our next it, council meeting. January 5th would be the January first 5th. regular meeting you know, okay. in January. So that, that you, doesn't sound like that would be a huge hardship. Um, no, this is the, if this was, if this was April, it'd be a different story, but um, this is, a, this is a great time of year. If, if we're going to delay a project, this would be the time to do it. Okay. Well, I remember uh, Mr. Shada had questions about lighting, but uh, Councillor Wolf was ready to make a motion. So, um, I'll, I'll delay on the motion so that Mr. Shada can speak since he's been waiting a long time. <laughs> yeah, great. That's it. Mr. Shada. Um, Mr. Mayor, I think my, uh, my questions were answered when Karen put up the slide that I also found on the Becker Street webpage about okay. where the lighting is supposed to be going. Okay, great. So your your curiosity is satisfied for the moment? Yes, for the lighting. Okay, is. great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Mayor, Mayor, we have two individuals that would like to speak if you want to allow that. Well, I see uh, Councilor Chenner. I mean, are these uh, non-members of council, is Denise? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm saying, okay. All right. Well, I see we have Kareen Toll and Jim Reese both have their hands raised. Um, all right. So let's go ahead and entertain their comments. Um, Judy, if you could bring them over, Kareen Toll and, and Jim Reese. I've gone ahead um, and Kareen Toll should be coming over to speak. Okay. Okay, and uh, Kareen and Jim, uh, if you could uh, limit your remarks to three minutes or less, that would be appreciated. 
Uh, and also we need to have, uh, when you announce, uh, when you take the microphone, if you'd uh, give us your name and address, please. Hi, I'm going, this is Corrine Toll. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you. All right. So uh, you all know that I have served on council in the past for six and a half years, and I don't ever remember a 158 page contract. And, and I find that a bit appalling uh, for any counselor who's not a lawyer to navigate. And so I really appreciate Judith Chandler's uh, comments on on trying to be more transparent. Why, why can't a contract be uh, more concise? Uh, it seems to me that sometimes making them lengthier is uh, a, a way of manipulation. So, you know, uh, the other thing that I really want, the other point I wanna make is what are our values here in Manitou? We, we have a lot of people purporting to, to really respect nature and, and want to encourage it. And now we're looking at a very important road. And I, I agree that this Becker's Lane Road is, is uh, uh, needs to be expanded. Uh, but, you know, it, what are we sacrificing in that process? So for, for me, it's, it's a question of uh, transparency regarding contracts and who are we as a community? That's all I have to say. Corrine, you, Corrine. you would like to provide us with your, um, your oh. address for the record, I'm, please? Sorry, yes, uh, I'm at 457 Krista Hills Boulevard in Manitou. Thank you. Thank you, Corrine. And now if we could hear from Jim Reese. Okay. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, just wanted to address a couple of things. I think there's some confusing, and I think Dole addressed this, is that 159 pages, I think, is referring to the contra construction documents that are typically that long. I mean, you've got all kinds of drawings and specifications. And so if you add all that up, yeah, it's a lot of technical uh, information that the contractor needs but not necessarily germane to understanding the project here uh, from the public standpoint. Um, and so I think that's where the misunderstanding is about the length of the, of the contract. Uh, the other thing is I wanted to kind of address the landscape plan and I think Karen did a great job. Uh, but remember this, the final landscape plan, and I think this goes back to Julie's comment, the final landscape plan incorporated all of the comments that were made at the public meeting uh, that added more trees in, preserves quite a few trees actually, and uh, created this understory. And a lot of that was a direct input from a lot of the folks, uh, citizens of Manitou. Uh, Melody particularly had great input as to what the pollinators uh, would like to see. And I think the, uh, they did a great job of incorporating that. So I think uh, uh, that we listened to the public and now I think we've got a great plan. And, and you know, I don't know if council, everybody knows this, but I'm a landscape architect by training. And I think the species and the plants that they have picked out are excellent. Uh, they will be long standing uh, improvements. Uh, these trees are great street trees that they picked out. So I think there are, this is an outstanding plan. Uh, and then the last comment I have is, well, is, is about the timing. Uh, and, and Joel's right, you could delay this contract at this point, but let's not forget, this is a six months window. And we really, especially from the Urban Renewal Authority's point of view, we really don't want to be into construction next summer. Mm -hmm. um, no way. We're going to store it right now. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Jim. Mr. Reese, if you could provide me with your address for the record, please. Uh, yeah, it's uh, 520 Silver Springs Circle, Colorado Springs. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. And I see that also uh, Alan Delwich would like to speak. Yes. So Judy, if we could uh, bring Alan over. <laughs> uh, 
Hi, uh, this is Alan Delwich. I live at 210 Via Linda Vista, about 200 yards from where this project is. And I did participate in both community meetings. And I also had a, a meeting with uh, Karen and Dole to talk about the lighting issues. But right now, what I'm concerned with is, you know, I believe at the community meetings, we whined a lot and fussed about the trees and finally reluctantly said, okay, we understand why you have to get rid of the 10 trees because they're not healthy and you have to do the undergrounding of utilities, et cetera. So that's where we were. If you look at the project page on our city website regarding the Becker's Bridge project, it says the arborist recommended removing 10 trees, which is what we, reluctantly agreed to. I'm concerned of now we're saying 14 trees and that looks like it's pretty much taking out everything on the east side. So I would love to have that resolved, have that explained by somebody how 10 turned into 14. The other issue that um, I don't know that we ever got a satisfactory resolution on was the lighting. And yes, you know, I'm, you know, I, I love the idea of having a vibrant URA. However, we have to remember this is a neighborhood here that's being in, affected. And I think that we really have to take the time to understand it and get down in the muck if we have to, whether it was my neighborhood or not, I think it's really important that we get these issues uh, really clearly resolved. And I really appreciate Councillor Chandler's uh, sticking to this and bringing it up and holding our feet to the fire. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Delwich. Let's see, I believe that's everyone who wanted to speak to this matter. All right. Uh, let's see, Councillor Chandler, do you have your hand up? I did. Um, I, I just want to say something generally, and I, I don't know that it really refers to exactly this contract, but I just wanna say that I have, um, you know, I have a master's degree in science. I don't have a master's degree in uh, construction. Um, but when I was elected to be a city council member, I met in February before COVID with engineers and people on Becker's Lane to talk about the Becker's Lane Bridge. And I said, in February of 2020, our tree, our, 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 how many of our old growth trees are gonna be sacrificed? And when I met with people there on that February day, I was told no tree, no old growth trees are gonna come out. And I said, good, because we need the canopy. We need this, we need the protection. And then uh, come down the road, um, everything changed. And I have learned, and it has been a tremendous learning process, both good and bad and ugly, that um, things change. But the bottom line is that if I don't understand a contract that I read for four hours, where I don't know where one unit equals one unit or one unit equals three units or four units, whether it's this contract or any other contract, how can I look in the eyes of my fellow manitoids and say, I voted in your best interest. So moving forward, we need to have a clear understanding and not and not um, hide or um, or um, window dress things that we want to slide through so that no one ever comes back to me and says, "Wow, you voted for this and that was not what we wanted." So my my thing is we we have a couple line items here. We have removal of fourteen trees at 15,400, which I am hearing you say is one unit equals one unit. And then on another line, I have tree retention, which I'm hearing is almost $12,000 unit, $12,000, where one unit equals three units, three trees, because I hear three trees are being preserved. I want to know which trees those are. And then I have a landscape uh, line item of almost $29,000, which does not identify 
any of the particular landscaping that is being done. It's just a, a blanket line item. So um, it's, it's not just for this contract, but contracts going forward, I'm disappointed because if I'm supposed to vote for things for my constituents, I want to, I want to be able to look you in the eye and say, I, I understand what I was voting for. And I feel like, I'm going to say this, that this, that these things are uh, designed to really make me wonder what I'm voting for. And I don't want to have to, that experience ever again. I have one more question, and that is on line item 211-0305, dewatering for $38,016. Um, what is dewatering and why are we spending $38,016 on it? Can you respond to that, please? So dewatering occurs when we start drilling caissons. So we drill the deep foundations on this bridge. You know, we obviously can't allow water to get in the holes because we have to build a tie rebar. We have to check the depth. We have to be able to measure it. And so the dewatering is to anticipate the fact that the, the water will, groundwater, creek water will seep into the holes. And so it allows the contractor to keep those holes dry for the whole duration and then to put the water back into the creek that seeped out. And again, okay, the, again, the way that is set up is we tell the contractor you need to, you need to perform. And I also wanna point out all of these specifications, standards and details are all the same standards and details that CDOT uses. So all of these pay items to use each and lump sum for landscaping, that is an industry standard. You know, CDOT does 150 jobs a year with those same specifications. So I think the big, the big concern for you is you, and I, it's fine with me, we have it. We can provide the specifications and the plan sheets whenever we provide a contract. I, uh, terrific. If you'd like to read through them and look at that, 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 I mean, that would be helpful. We already have it. It's no big deal to attach it. Okay. Um, that's dewatering. So in response, I want to say that after looking at this agreement, um, I, I, you know, um, I, I have a master's degree in something else, but I understand topsoil and I understand gutters and I understand sidewalks, but I'm going to call you on things I don't understand, and I don't know what dewatering is. So if I'm going to represent the uh, citizens of Manitou, and not everyone on city council that runs for city council can have a an engineer's degree, I'm going to ask you about these things, and I, I just so I, just so I make sure that I understand what that means. I if if we're going to spend thirty eight thousand dollars on something, I just want to know what it is, and 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 I realize my my ineptness or or, or uh, you know or 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 a non education. Uh, I can certainly probably Google these things, but th these are things that um, in a in a in a contract this um, complex. Um, you know, I applaud you. I applaud you. My concern is I was told two separate things. In February, I was told that no tr old growth trees were going to go down. And now, then I was told they were all going down. And then there was a community, you know, process. And so then I'm learning in this contract, one equals one on one light item, but one equals three on another light item. And I just want to acknowledge to the city that any any person any person if you're listening in and you're you know you 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 just want to know what this is about you should be able to get online and understand this contract and not have to go holy shit i don't know what this means and so you know that that's where i'm coming from is is um you know what you know i i've learned the hard way you know what trees are going to come out old growth trees are gonna come out. You're gonna take out how many old growth trees you're gonna take out. But my job is to stop and say, where, are, where is our money being spent? Are we respecting the people of Manitou in any contract, in any contract? And can any, can any average person understand it? because we can't, so, and that's the problem. Yeah. Okay.
don't think uh, so I have I have three things to make here so it sounds like the, the real issue here is the confusion between the bid items suggesting 14 tree removal and then like even like Alan suggested that the assumption was 10 and I I don't remember the details and I we can look into this and we can see if it, if it was just a mistake in the bid tab and the nice thing is is I can go and tell the contractor we're going to change it. There was a mistake and it's 14 was wrong. It's actually 10 and they'll say, okay, great. And the reason why we have that each item is all I got to do is remove four from the each there's 10 left and they know how much to get paid per tree. It works out great. But I, again, I don't know the final number. I just, I don't, I don't remember. There's, you know, it's been about a thousand numbers since then. So we will get, we will find out what was agreed to and confirmed. Okay. The other thing is this Becker's project has been having bi-weekly meetings for the last year. Um, perhaps we can start inviting council to all these capital improvement no. bi-weekly meetings. No, they have Could to be I, public if you do that. So. Oh, that's I always forget about that. I don't know how else to communicate for you to get through and ask about bid items. And you got to remember too, and and this is this is this is maybe why it puts you in a tough spot. The plans and specifications we put out are for the contractors to be able to read and interpret to go build the job. So they are written in language and definitions that they're comfortable with, that they're used to, that are industry standards, that they bid you know, 10 jobs a year and they know exactly what these line items mean. And like you said, you, you don't, right? This is, this is a foreign language, just like a lot of other things are foreign to me, um, but this is just an industry standard for them. So I, I, don't, I don't know how to bridge that gap um, but these plans and specs go out to the contractors. You know, the public now, engagement and the public information is where we really try to engage the public. This is exactly the point I'm trying to make, Joel, and thank you for that. Because you know what? Um, I, 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 I speak in medical ease. I can talk in medical language that you don't even understand. And you can talk in contractor language that I don't understand. But the bottom line is we, we <laughs> represent a community of Manitou that has, that wants to understand, right? So if I can't even get through a contract, right, with a master's degree, how can I tell the citizens of Manitou that I'm representing you with the best interests of everything that you said you wanted? And that's the biggest problem I have with this city and other governments is that we have to develop a language that is inclusive. That if my neighbor next door said, I got, I, you know, I looked at the packet and I looked yeah. at that 159 page. Hey, Councilor Chandler, I think we understand your point, Councilor Chandler. So could you, could you wrap it up, yeah. please? Oh, I, you know, I can, I can, Mayor. That, you know what, you, you and I and everybody on council represent the citizens of Manitou and we need to speak in a language, including our contractual language, that people can understand and actually be able to ask questions about. That's it. Okay. Okay. Um, I believe Councillor Wolf, you are entertaining a motion perhaps? You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to move to postpone this discussion to January 5th. I would like um, the contract to incorporate by reference all of the mandatory drawings that are mandatory, if they're going to be mandatory, and particularly regarding landscaping as well as lighting. So that was another big controversial thing. People were very upset about the lighting and the feedback I got was that those community meetings, they left the community meetings where they were told, well, too bad, the lighting is the way it is because that's the way they do it in Colorado Springs and the citizens were very angry. So I want those drawings to be not just concept plans that are nice ideas, but to be a mandatory part of the contract because I don't see them as being part of exhibit A. I agree with Chandler that we have had a lack of disclosure, not intentional necessarily, but we need these drawings. We need to see these pictures and, and, and it's no excuse to say, oh, well, the citizens should have gone to that meeting and they didn't, so too bad, no. They have the right to go to the packet and see what we're voting on and see if they want to give input and see the drawings themselves and see what's being proposed 
I want to know what's uh, specifically what the outcome of the um, lighting dispute was. And so have the contract uh, redrawn so it's properly uh, tightened up. And, um, and then we can talk about it on January 5th. So uh, that's my motion. I'm sorry, it wasn't a very clear motion. Is, do you want me to restate it just to say postpone to January 5th with much more information, please? Well, that's that's what I would prefer, Julie, if you would make it, if you would simplify it to January 5th with the uh, uh, considerations of the discussion tonight as opposed to the specifics, or, or to specifically to um, landscaping and um, uh, tree removal and um, lighting. Lighting, thank you. Thank you. Is that a second, Nancy? A second. I'm thank sorry. you. <laughs> Councilor Chandler, did you second? I did. Okay, second. Okay, so we have motion second. Any further discussion? Okay, so basically the motion is to postpone this item until January the 5th and to incorporate the discussion points into the, um, to, to look into that, to clarify that, particularly with respect to lighting to the trees and that the drawings be incorporated uh, as part of the contract. As part of the, and as part of the packet. As part sure. Of the packet. Okay. So that it's public. Public. Okay, so I hope I restated your motion, Julie. Is that a fair statement? Okay. Subject um, to my changes. Yeah, it wasn't comprehensive, but it was part of it. Understand. Uh, the, the part that you missed was that I, I want the packet to include the information we're talking about, including the drawings and the new and improved contract. I don't want the public to be told, oh, well, you don't get to see it unless you go to the Becker Street website or sorry, you missed the meeting. I think it should be in the packet. So that's the part you missed. Okay. All right, thank you for that clarification. If there's any further discussion? Okay, if not, let's vote all in favor of postponing until January the 5th, say aye, raise your hand. Okay, it's unanimous, okay. John, All could right. I make another recommendation that Please. perhaps um, we could find a course for council on contracting because it's a very, 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 very complex thing. And um, to have a better understanding of how contracts are written, et cetera, et cetera, I think might be helpful. Uh, may I comment on that? Please, Julie. Uh, yeah, rather than us going to school on contract law, which is like, good luck with that. I would suggest that it might be helpful if they're a, like a little key, like a little legend at the bottom of the page. P.S. This word means this. Or P.S. Uh, for more information on landscaping, go to the drawing at section exhibit A-22. Or, you know, if, if you want to know what rebar is, you know, uh, look it up on Google. Uh, there's some kind of little key would be fine, and that way we can track what's being said uh, rather than <laughs> learning how to read a contract. <laughs> and I believe also that uh, the Carter Municipal League, I think they have some materials. Uh, it's kind of a, a layman's quick guide to contracts, which is uh, maybe I could call it the cartoon version of contracts, which might also be uh, helpful for, uh, for some folks. Uh, Dole, you have a follow on comment for this? So what you are describing is uh, such a difficult thing only because it's a whole, it's a whole industry. I mean, it just like if I went to worked with Ms. Chandler, I mean, I would have no idea what she said when she says CCs and IV and that, that's, that's my medical knowledge. I tend to just faint when I walk into an ER anyways. Um, so I can present the information and I'm happy to respond to specific questions. Um, I, I, all, I also love to give tours of job sites and help people actually see what's going on and to point stuff out. So uh, I'm happy to provide information, but to provide a key, I, I, don't even, I, don't even, I don't even know where to begin with something like that. So what if we just, what, let's work on putting this together with a Jeff and see what we can do for the next time and try to include everything that's been requested. So let's see what we can do and then we'll bring it back. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, so we've now finished with the consent calendar, <laughs> basically. Um, we have a couple of public hearings. Uh, the history was that these are both second, uh, second reading. They seem to be fairly uncontroversial. Um, we've been at this an hour and a half. We did have a short break. Would anyone care to take a break now, come back to it, or do you want to push on? 
I'm sorry, Judith, what was that? Was that for, for taking a break? Can we take five minutes? Okay, five minutes. I've got 7.35. Let's be back Mayor, 7.40. Oh, Mayor, sorry, before, yes, we, before we take a break, can I just want to say, I, I really want, I want council to know that there was, we were never trying, nor was any staff trying to hide anything. I think we were trying to be as transparent, probably more transparent than ever by listing every single thing possible. But you had some great questions and, and what does this mean? What does that mean? So we'll work on that and we'll come back with a more comprehensive um, contract. But I will say Dole nor Karen nor anybody was trying to hide any anything at any time. So thank you. Let's say 742, okay? See y'all in... Like we've got everybody but Mr. Parker. Oh, there he is. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and get started then. Um, our next item of business is second reading and public hearing of ordinance number 1520, an ordinance vacating a portion of the of the Fairview Avenue right of way adjacent to the property known as 515 Ruxton Avenue, City of Manitou Springs, El Paso County, Colorado. So first we'll start with city staff. Um, of course, we discussed this two weeks ago. Um, Michelle, I guess you'll be briefing us on this. So if you could bring us up to speed with any additions, corrections, comments, that sort of thing. Sure. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I really don't have any additions other than uh, to add to what I presented uh, at the last meeting. And you have the uh, same uh, ordinance uh, in your packet. Uh, this is uh, for unused right of way that uh, actually some of the COG operation is located on and uh, we're trying to go through the replat process which was required by the development, uh, I'm sorry, the conditional use for the COG. Um, and so to clean that up, uh, we've staff has required that they go through the vacation of right of way. Um, and they do own the property on either side of this right of way. So I'm, I'm more than happy to try to answer questions um, and uh, any kind of issues that might come up. Does anyone have a question for Michelle at this point? Apparently none. Okay, thank you. Um, what we'd, we'd next like to hear from the applicant. Um, Judy, I see Mr. Johnston is in the audience. Um, has he indicated that he'd like to speak or? Judy, you're muted. I can't hear you. If you could bring Mr. Johnston over, that'd be good. Judy, you're muted. Good evening, Mr. Johnston. Hi. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council. Um, no, uh, no comments from us. Uh, appreciate staff's help on this. This has been a, an interesting process to go through as we've uh, uncovered uh, the the right of way and trying to make all our uh, parcels of land that we own fit to get uh, fit together as a uh, part of our uh, requirement to meet here. Um, but uh, just happy to get it all done and, and move forward. Great, thank you. Um, well, next I will open up the public hearing portion of the meeting. So the floor will now be opened up to any members of the public who'd like to make a comment. Uh, so if you're in the audience and you'd like to speak to this, please uh, use the raise hand feature in, um, in Zoom. So the city clerk will, and the council will know that you wish to address this. This wasn't very controversial, so I'm not surprised. I don't see any hands out there. Um, Judy, had anyone asked to, to address this? Okay, not surprised. All right, in that case, I will close the public hearing portion, the public comment. Um, council, do you have any questions for either city staff or for the applicant? 
Okay, I don't see any discussion then. Um, I would entertain a motion. Mayor, I move we uh, move approval of ordinance number 1520. Okay, we have a motion by Councilman Shada. And then we a have second. A, uh, council, both councilors uh, Chandler and Wolf have second, so it sounds like we're ready. Um, any further discussion? No? Okay, all in favor of uh, approving, raise your hand, say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Mr. Johnston, thank you. Michelle, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. You're okay, welcome. very good. All right. Uh, next item is second reading and public hearing of ordinance number 1720, an ordinance amending Title VII of the Manitou Springs Municipal Code to move animal related fees from the Municipal Code to a fee schedule. Okay, and this will be a public hearing. First, we'll hear from city staff if they have any comments they want to make. Okay, so. Okay, Becca, you have the floor. Okay, so this is a very non-controversial um, ordinance, just updating our code, taking out some money amounts that we hadn't realized were in there. But I do have a change which has been, um, brought to my attention by our city administrator. And I had thought we had already taken care of this whole thing. And I was like, it's too late. We'll have to bring it again next year for a new ordinance. But then she's like, no, it's tonight. So here I am. And the change is this. If you read the rabies area of the code, and it's also in the ordinance because it was taking out the money amount, but it says, renew the rabies vaccine every two years. Well, everyone that has a dog knows that you can go three years now. There are three year rabies vaccines. So uh, we would like to go ahead and clean up the code there. Can Jeff, is it okay to change the amendment to say, I mean, the ordinance to say, and uh, change the rabies vaccine uh, to uh, current, where we take out that two year business? Yeah, so city council can basically approve the ordinance with, with uh, the revision that you're basically recommending if they wanna do that. And then it would be approved with that revision, we'd make it and then the published version would basically have that revision in it. Okay, so because the Humane Society, they don't specify it has to be a three year or two year or anything. They just say you have to have a current rabies vaccination, a ra current rabies uh, vaccination certificate or whatever it is. And so we just wanna make our code match uh, the Humane Society and not make people who have a three year uh, rabies uh, vaccine go after only two years to get the, the dog revaccinated when when it's good for another year. So, so we Becca, just want to clean that up. Becca, your recommendation is that it just reads a current rabies vaccine, correct? Because they could get a one year or a three year. Is that correct? Exactly. We don't know what they're getting. So let's make it just current. Just uh, I'm just trying to find where that is in the code. And and I guess, you know, my only concern is is like we got to make sure people understand what current means. I mean, there's got to be some reference to what is current. Um, so uh, can, I, can I just say that that was one of my questions and I have three dogs and uh, rabies vaccines in El Paso County are either one year or three years and there is no two year vaccine now. So if we put it as current El Paso County guidelines, would that suffice? Jeff, it's at 7.0702 to O. Yeah. B. Uh, B. Jeff, what if you said something like us that, you know, you cannot have an expired, you cannot have one that has expired. I don't know if that word is good enough for the medical terminology, but rather than yeah, just I not guess expired. I'm just, yeah, I guess a, 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 you know, a rabies vaccine that, uh, I guess that makes sense. I, um, let me see here. Yeah, so um, I'm reading it. So I suppose I can be here. Um, Look, it's paragraph D. 
under the, the section. Well, I'll say the cat or dog um, must maintain um, maintain a uh, current rabies um, vaccination um, as re you know, I guess as required by, I guess it would be uh, generally accepted veterinary practices or something like that. Because then maybe in four years they can give ten-year rabies vaccines. I don't know. Um, would that be appropriate? Yeah, I like say, the same current. Or could we say as required by the Humane Society because they're the ones that's by the El Paso County? We could do that. I mean, I guess. I mean, I guess my problem is: is do they actually? Does the Humane Society like require vaccines? They do, yes. but they just say current. Right, but I mean, I guess I'm wondering, like, what? Like, I don't think they actually have any like requirements. Like, they're a humane society, and so, right? I, I mean, I think that we just said we want to have a, a current <laughs> vaccine that has not expired. But, but it's my understanding that El Paso County requires a current rabies vaccine, and that is either every one or three years, and the human society must adhere to that. So. Um, I have three dogs, so I just know that just because my vet says so. Um, so I have three year rabies vaccines for all of my dogs, but um, it's my understanding that you either get a one year or a three year rabies vaccine for dogs and cats. Well, Jeff, why don't we just say it has to be in compliance with the county uh, regulations? That's a lot better than the Humane Society. Yeah, yeah, I mean that that would yeah. that would yeah, the, humane, totally. the humane society is responsible for licensing, and this is a licensing requirement. You have to show proof of a current current rabies vaccine in accordance with current, uh, veterinary practice um, in order to obtain a license with the humane society that licenses for Manitou Springs. Right. We we deliberately didn't want to reference humane society in our code. Uh, because if the names or something changed, then we'd have to go and change it again. But in this case, uh, I'm open. I, I defer to the expert. I, I would probably just change that second sentence to say rabies vaccinations um, shall be kept current um, according to, uh, maybe we could say El Paso County, I guess, according to El Paso County, or we could say according to um, generally accepted veterinary practices. And then- It's uh, in done. El Paso County. Mm -hmm. That'd be fine. In El Paso County, so that we're not doing a nationwide assessment. <laughs> right. So to, to go back over that, how should that sentence read and where would it be located? So it'll um, be in 7.07.020 .07 subsection B. B, okay. Be the second sentence in that section, um, I would just say uh, rabies inoculation shall be maintained, shall be, shall be maintained for such animals according to um, generally accepted veterinary practices in El Paso County. Writing it down while I speak quickly. <laughs> I'll second that. In a second. Okay. So we any further? Hear you. <laughs> we have any further discussion then? Um, who made the motion? Who made not. the motion, Judy? Do we know who oh, made the motion? We don't have a motion yet. Oh, was, okay. Well, oh, okay. I'm sorry. That's like I was pretending that Jeff made the motion. Okay. Well, I'm, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Julie, I thought you were making the motion there. I'm sorry. No, I was um, second in Jeff, but I, I can do it. Uh, uh, do we have to open up the public hearing first? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> there, since there was an applicant, I, I was out of sight, out of mind. My apologies. Um, no, you're, you're correct. Um, so this is a public hearing. Uh, I will open up the, uh, the meeting for public comment on this topic. Um, anyone in the audience who wishes to speak to this, please raise your hand on the uh, using the Zoom feature. Judy, did we have any? Did we have anyone uh, contact you guys? Okay, and I'm not surprised. It was not not very controversial. Okay, appearing. It, it appears that there's uh, no one wants to talk to this. Uh, no one in the audience. So, I will close the public hearing, and we'll. Okay, I think we're back to where we were a minute ago. 
Um, Mr. Parker, you were crafting the sentence. Uh, yeah, it would say rabies inoculation shall be maintained for such animals according to generally accepted veterinary practices in El Paso County. And I can okay. send over a revised version with that language for Judy to post. Okay. Thank you. Good, thank you. Okay. So do we have a motion? Uh, Councilor Wolf? I move to approve ordinance number 1720, subject to the uh, change just identified by our city attorney, Jeff Parker. Thank you. Do we have a second? Do have a second from uh, Mayor Pro Tem? Okay, any further discussion? Apparently not. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Rebecca, thank you very much. I'll okay. be back. Okay, all righty. Uh, next item, um, resolution number 3620, a resolution to affirm support for expansion of the, historic, the historical Carnegie Library building located at 710 Manitou Avenue, Manitou Springs, Colorado. And as you will all recall, this was something we discussed or heard about last week during the work session. So, the text is in the packet. Are you ready for a motion? Do we want to discuss it? Do we have, uh, we have public discussion? Um, Judy, was this the uh, issue that we had someone for public comment or? Yes, probably about the library. Okay. Did, um, Okay, was was there okay? Was there someone okay? Was that Bob Todd or yes. Christine or Bob Todd? Bob Todd. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see he's in the audience. Um, Mr. Todd, if you uh, want to speak to this, could you raise your hand in the Zoom feature? Okay, I guess he's over. Um, all righty. He's muted. Did you? Okay, I just Mr. unmuted myself. Is that correct? Yeah, you're you're not muted. We can hear you, Bob. We can't see you. Okay. And what I've asked Judy to do is put up two charts. One is an email that I sent to council at two o'clock today, and the other is the attachment to that email. Uh, I was at my home office. Bob, to... Bob we need you to uh, give us your address, okay? Oh, okay? And I would also mention if you could keep your comments to three minutes or less, please. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Bob Todd, 20 Manitou Terrace, Manitou Springs. An administrative item, I'm trying to coordinate with Julie, pulling up two charts. One chart is an email, Judy, uh, Judy has that. The, and all council members received that at two o'clock today. So I think some of you have responded to that email. Uh, and then secondly, uh, pulling up this red line, which uh, Judy, I'm now looking at it. It looks like you were able to open that on a PC and show the actual red line. Thank you. Unfortunately, council members who looked at this with their iPad, uh, I don't believe you had an app that allowed you to see the actual red line. So. You now have it on your screen. Uh, so I'm going to go over to the summary email that introduces this. <clears throat> this email was put together after an hour meeting this morning with Christine and Rob Dannon. And the reason why you see a red line is the following. <clears throat> In 2016, which would have been the Cole Nicoletis Council, uh, was the final time the council looked at the Thorpe uh, draft architectural plans. The direction that was given to Mr. Thorpe and the planning department was to enter into a, an analysis of 
what functions are going to be in the library and at what cost, and to have a public engagement process that would optimize the library so final architectural plans could be drafted up and then proceed to getting final cost estimates. What happened was Mr. Thorpe was given $50,000 to do that. He started the work to come up with different scenarios based on council's input as to modifications council would like to have seen or fact be factored in, as well as work with the library to know exactly what functions were going into meeting rooms and so forth. <clears throat> Mr. Thorpe started that process, came back to council and said, you all have provided me with $50,000 to do that. I'm more than happy to do that. But my major concern is you are also presently looking at a fire uh, complex and you've been discussing having to have a capital plan and you've been discussing having to have a mechanism to fund the library. You know, with all due respect, I would suggest you put me on furlough until you figured out a way to raise the kind of capital we're talking about. He had that estimate of $3 million, which you've heard before. That was the end of council's participation in this process. Although the planning commission, I believe went through a quasi judicial process looking at the plans, but council, this is a major development, never approved it because that was what was to happen. <clears throat> That's where the, the things were frozen. Fast forward to Ken Jure's council. And as you know, right at the end, this project was added to the MAC, but the project itself was still based on draft architectural plans. And this optimization process had not gone through. Uh, what function are you getting for what cost? So in your cover memo, you see the six items that were left as being open before we would be at final architectural uh, at that stage. When you read the ordinance, the ordinance assumes that we have these final uh, architectural concept documents, which are be, be, to be turned into uh, construction documents. So final cost estimates can be done. Well, this is the cart before the horse, which is really why you see all those red line edits and that particular discussion. Again, I had an hour discussion with Christine and with Rob. Uh, Christine followed the general drift of this and the need to do some backfilling, uh, including the first step would actually be to do an RFP to architects to finish the final uh, concept designs and get agreement Bob, on. Bob, this we need you to does, sum up, okay? This document does not reflect that. And therefore, my recommendation is, just like you had to do with the Becker's Lane Lodge, is allow this thing to be tweaked along the lines of the red lines. This is not the, the meeting to do that and come back on January 5th, I believe it is, with a resolution that is factually correct. Otherwise, this resolution, if approved as draft, that is not factually correct. And that would be my issue with it. Myself, personally, I 100% support the library. I was involved with the, the Matt Kavanaugh effort to do, to get this public financing. Um, I've not had the time to join Rob's group as a citizen to do that. I would have otherwise done it. Uh, but I need to step in with this historical background that I think Susan and Nancy can vouch for it, as well as all the council members on Ken Jure's council. That's into my comments. Great. Thank you, Mr. Todd. Okay. Thank you. And Judy, if you'd take the screen down, please. Yep. Okay. Judy, I don't know if anyone else had expressed an interest in, in speaking to this. Um, I see Christine is here. Um, well, perhaps council, if anyone has questions or comments, this would be the, the next step. <laughs> Any council members have questions or comments? 
Mayor Potem? A um, couple things. One is um, I was quite comfortable with the um, resolution as written. Um, and I can see though where Mr. Todd may have interpreted it slightly differently than I did. I interpreted it that the RFP was for the final design um, and that, that could be um, that the Thorpe design was the beginning and the, co the concept, not the Thorpe design, but the Thorpe concept really, and that a final design would be done from that concept. So um, I again think that the resolution that we had as a um, monument to the meeting that we had back in October, that's all that it was intended to um, capture. Um, additionally, I believe I read Mr. Todd's email that Rob Dannon's group, or Rob, because I don't think he's had a task force meeting since this came at the last minute today, um, was not in agreement with Mr. Todd's um, recommendations. So I'd like to hear from Rob and Christine as to what the city uh, staff is recommending on this. Okay. And if council has no objections, we'll hear from Christine. You'd like me to bring Rob over as well at this time? Oh, please, please do that. Do, please do so. Yeah. Okay. Christine, do you have comments on this? Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. I, don't, I don't have any further comments um, or suggestions for clarification. Um, we are we are trying to just simply monument the discussion at the meeting and and factual um, meeting minutes and things like that. So okay. that's all. Thanks Thank very you. much. And we now have Mr. Dannon present. Uh, Mr. Dannon, do you have comments? You, you're muted, Rob. Rob, you're muted. I will. I always promised myself I would never be caught muted, and I just ruined my streak. Um, so. Um, I didn't catch all of Christine's uh, part because I was still being brought in. <clears throat> but um, I concur with Nancy um, in terms of the resolution was really almost like a diary of what we've done uh, starting, well, we started before that, but from our conversations with city council on October 13th to where we are now and where we hope to go from those points on. And so um, I think that the resolution is well stated for our intentions. Um, and that if we postpone it to the January 5th, I mean, again, it's another kicking the can down the road when this resolution is adequate for where we are right now and all the cooperation and collaboration and discussions with the city and the city council. It's an ongoing process with us and this is just reflects that. And uh, to come in at the last minute and say, uh, let's move in a different direction, um, I just don't think it's warranted. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dannon. And for the record, we need your address, please. Sure. 112 Cave Avenue, Manitou Springs. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, council members, do you have any questions or comments now? If not, okay. Council, uh, Councilor Wilbrook. Thanks, Mayor. And I saw that Julie Wolf had her hand up too. Oh, okay. Uh, well, okay. we're going before we do that. Um, I, I would like to postpone this and maybe do a little bit of consideration of some of the edits that um, Mr. Todd proposed. Um, boy, it was an interesting night tonight, right? And we had a lot of people ask a lot of questions and, and like, what are our values? And we talked a lot about trees and I just wanna remind everybody, this is one of Manitou's parks. This is our sledding hill. There are trees there. Um, so I think, um, some other comments that I will make is I'd really hope that Hyagatha Gardens would present at the same time we had the library work session. I understand that they couldn't. I'm not faulting anybody for that. But one of my big concerns about this is and about MASH and everything else that I keep saying at every meeting is we need, we have a, we're a city with a lot of capital needs and I've yet to see the kind of comprehensive look at that that I think I'd like to see before we make some of these really big decisions. So I'd really like to hear where we are with Hiawatha Gardens before moving forward on this um, as written. 
Um, and there's just some things that, you know, we've really glossed over that are happening in the community that I think we're going to regret. And one of them is that we have had some alternative looks at what fixing this building and making it ADA compliant would look like. Those don't seem to get mentioned at these meetings. I'm not sure why, but I'm just saying they're out there. People are talking about them. Um, I'm a little distressed that we've sort of moved in a direction not to go to the voters with this. That seemed to be what I heard in that work session. That distresses me. Um, and I see a lot of parallels here between the fire tower training that happened before I was on council that went on the ballot. It was gonna be at Public Works. There was a lot of concern in that neighborhood about that. It didn't pass. There's been some really great progress on a fire, fire training tower at a much reduced cost. I know that there's still some neighbors up in that area now that have some concerns. I think those will be resolved, but I see a lot of parallels here that aren't making me feel really comfortable. Um, the other thing that I would say is that I loved Andy Vick's um, note in the Colorado Springs Business Journal. I don't know if you read his editorial, any of you, but he talked about what a great partnership it was to have PPLD at the MAC. And I've said here, and I've said it many times, I'd really like to see that happen for a year and get a good comprehensive report on what worked and what didn't with that space and other things. Um, and so we can't go for these grants till 2022. I think that there's some things about memorializing this that puts us on a path where we can only use the Thorpe plans if that's what we're raising money for and we're telling people that. I'm, I'm not terribly comfortable with that because I think... Susan, we lost you, if you can hear us. Susan? Judy, can you tell us anything? <laughs> she, it looks like she may have to log out. And yeah, come back. you're seeing the same thing I'm seeing. She's still she's still on there, but somehow we lost her. Okay. Well, if it's all right, uh, Councillor Wolf had her hand up next, I believe. So, um, and then we'll go to Councillor Chandler. Uh, Councillor Wolf. Oh, thank you. I um, I just wanted to comment that if you look at section one of the resolution, once you get past all those whereases, it just says that we're moving forward with an RFP for final design and construction costs. My understanding of Bob Todd's presentation was that this only provides for construction costs. And how can you know what the construction costs are if you don't know what the design is? Um, but that it says right there, final design. So I, I don't know that that would address all of his concerns, but it already says that. And, and in response to Susan's comments, um, which I sh have shared those same concerns, I, I thought, wow, uh, I've heard and seen some alternative drawings for the library other than the Thorpe sketch. And here we are first reading adopting Thorpe. And I thought, well, all right, you know. Um, but I, I don't know if that's necessarily the best design either. Um, and so when I look at this, whereas uh, I'm assuming that the final design that we would be shelling out money for someone to do would be based on Thorpe, but that's not even required in this resolution. So theoretically, the RFP could allow the person to come up with a whole new drawing. I'm not sure what I'm recommending because I need to think about it, but um, I do, I share some of Susan's concerns in that respect. I wish she could come back. <laughs> oh, may I ask Christine, since we're waiting, um, may I ask a question of Christine Mayer uh, in that respect? Yeah, yeah, go ahead and then we'll we'll hear from Councillor Chandler. Okay, so Christine, when, when you were looking at this business here where it says that we're going to hire someone, put out an RFP for a final design, were you envisioning that the final design would be based on the preliminary design that was done by Mr. Thor? There's inspiration there and there's a process. There's a lot of public input. 
um, we recognize that <clears throat> I recognize as a project manager and background engineering that that what was what was fully in the Thorpe drawings is there there are opportunities for updating those and there there are um, I wish Susan were here <laughs> Councillor Holbrook I would I, oh here she comes. <clears throat> <laughs> Susan, you're muted. Uh, Councilor Woolbrook, you're muted. Could you could you unmute yourself for a second so we can figure out where you're at? Yeah, I'm so sorry. My council iPad won't hold a charge and I've got it plugged in. So I may just need to call in, but I'm not familiar with doing that. So maybe Julie could, uh, not Julie, but Judy Morgan could send me an instruction via email on the phone in process. Oh, we have you now. We can hear you and see you. I am at like at 1%, just a warning. Oh. Okay. So, uh, Councilor, well, but Councilor Wolf did uh, make some comments here while you were uh, gone, and she, she had some similar thoughts to yours. She was asking uh, uh, Christine some questions. Um, Thank you. But so Susan, I, do, you want a, do you want a minute to switch over to the phone so you don't? So we can have this conversation with you? Absolutely, that would be wonderful. Um, and I'm looking for Judy Morgan maybe to send me an email to my council email on how to do that. Working on it right now. Thank you, I appreciate it. Sorry guys. No, it's okay, this is the, the world of Zoom. It was at 100% when I started and I looked up and it's at 1% and it's been, I plugged it in like 30 minutes ago. There she goes. Anyway, that answers my question, Christine. That does. In other words, I would imagine it would be much more costly if someone is coming up with a brand new idea. Um, and I know there are some people in town with strong feelings that their ideas are better than the Thorpe one. Um, and so that would be my only hesitation here is that's true. This is I'm just, you know, it, it may tweak the Thorpe design and it doesn't require Thorpe in here, but everyone's assumption, even though it doesn't say it in the resolution, is that the final design will be based on Thorpe. Uh, you know, I'm so. Well, those are fair, <clears throat> excuse me, those are fair, fair questions. And um, I am in regular communication as folks who have wanted to come forward and contribute to what they feel like um, might be a better alternative. Uh, one of those I had a conversation just recently today had a conversation with and um, you know he had some concerns about where are we in the process wanted to um, ensure that that some of these other ideas are going to be considered. And so I think Frankly, on an engine from an engine from a design standpoint, and then getting into engineering, there's still a lot of work to go. Um, you know, I do. If we scaled down the the footprint, um, and it's still in the spirit of the Thorpe process, the that footprint that went through um, the planning, or excuse me, the historical commission and, and the community process. I think there's a lot of value to that, you know, keeping a similar footprint, whether it's slightly smaller or the same. Um, but in terms of how it's used on the interior and how that's laid out, I think, I think there's, there's still active conversations, um, that can be had and we're, we're actively discussing that with, um, with the task force there's going to be more public input processes. Um, I see there's Councillor Wilbur. Oh, so actually, so that's really helpful information because that makes me conclude that this is premature. There's no reason to pay somebody $50,000 to come up some drawing and then six weeks later or two months later after the holidays, our public process decides we don't like that drawing anymore. We want a whole different thing. So well, if we, maybe I'm leaning more toward what Bob taught. Uh, well, anyway, yeah. If we stop, I, I wouldn't want to pay someone fifty thousand dollars and say, "Well, we might want a whole different design. It might be smaller. We haven't decided if we really want one or two bathrooms. We don't know if the elevator should be inside or outside. But here's fifty grand. You know, let us know, and then after the drawing's done, maybe the public process will decide. Now nah, let's start over with something different. Like that's just silly. So maybe well, we could nail down the public process first, so we know what the heck they're trying to finalize 
what I'm what I'm looking for in this RFP is to understand what the cost is going to be to get there. Um, right now, if if I if I don't bring in any kind of architect, um, we're stagnant, and so we'd like to get that started. I'm in, I'm looking forward to a phased a, a phased design process where we continue with the input. Um, it's critical that the Pikes Peak Library District is, is a partner in this. Um, I'm from a timeline perspective. <clears throat> I would like to hit the grant cycle this year, and the grant cycle can support some of this outreach, some of the final design where we get to. So, so, th so that's some of my interest in, um, I don't believe that we have to wait for grants until 2022. We can get moving on that this year. Um, as well, you know, getting further along and understanding what our costs are going to be, that helps us put forward a business plan. Um, but how could you have the cost if you don't know how many elevators you want or how many bathrooms you want or if it's going to be, you know, twice as big as it is now or just 30% larger. So to me, I, I appreciate everything you're saying, but you don't get caught, you know, that's like, you don't get cost on something that hasn't been designed yet. So, I mean, and you don't design something and pay a designer to design something if you're still having community input on what we want. So that's my, that's the problem I'm having. Okay. Okay. I, I, appreciate, you. I appreciate your answers. I mean, I understand what you're saying and I agree, you need costs, but okay. I, I, I think it's premature if you don't know what you're, what you're estimating. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Councillor uh, Chandler had her hand up and then Denise, I also wanna see if Susan can hear us. Uh, Susan Wilbrook, can, can you hear us? Can we hear you? I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you. We can hear you. Okay, so you're 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 back in the meeting. Okay, great. Okay, so thank you, um, Councillor Chandler. Please, you're muted, Ju Judith. Did Councillor Wilbrick have a comment to make? Because she would precede me, or was she just muted? No, thank you. I. I so. Uh, we're just trying to see if we could talk to her and so, do more, but um, no, I'm not sure. Um, I, I, uh, Hitler, you take the floor. Okay, thank you. I think we can all agree that the Carnegie Library is such an iconic building and that we would love to preserve it as a library and work with the PPLD to um, reinstate library services at the Carnegie Library at some point. Um, I, um, you know, what a difference a year makes, right? Um, it's especially this year. And while um, I, I looked at the Thorpe uh, drawings and, uh, and, and conceptual uh, ideas about the library, um, it is, we're moving into 2021, and I think it is reasonable to um, consider uh, Bob, uh, Bob Todd's um, and other people's um, input about where we are now. So if we could um, agree on, yes, we want to refurb our library, and yes, we want it to be a library, I think it's uh, a reasonable, time to um, look at all conceptual um, drawings that might be submitted and to consider all um, input at this point. Um, so, so I don't, I don't, you know, I know this has been a very long process and it's been going on for decades, but I, I do want the people to know that, yes, we want to preserve the library. Yes, we want it to be a library. And yes, we're at a position where, what is a library? I mean, we have to ask ourselves in 2021, what is a library? And does the Thorpe plan fit into the, um, the, the uh, long-term conceptual idea of what we wanna have to be a library? And I'm not saying that the Thorpe uh, plan is, is, is uh, 
a Neanderthal. I'm just saying that maybe uh, we need to take a look at um, introducing another uh, uh, other concept drawings and architectural uh, submissions to the library. So yes, I want to move forward. Yes, I want it to be a library. And yes, I think it's a great time to look at um, a plethora of ideas of what the library will look like. Thank you. There, Denise, I believe you had your hand up. Um, no, uh, I just, I, I want to make sure I understand just so that and maybe everybody else understands that what I'm hearing is you want to take a step back and get more public participation regarding what the library looks like at this time. Is that what I'm hearing from everyone? I've heard that from several council people, certainly, I think. Um, because I believe, and I don't know when this group first started um, presenting, but I, I think they were going down the path saying, yes, we wanna go with that Thorpe. And then that's the direction that you gave them a couple of months ago, maybe three months ago that you said, yes, this is the way we're going. And then I'm hearing tonight, you wanna to take a moment, some are wanting to say, let's take a moment and let's uh, get more public input. It, and that's all I'm asking, is that the direction that you're looking at? Well, we've got some other council people to hear from also, so stay tuned. <laughs> okay, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. I, I don't see what um, Councillor Chandler and Councillor Wolf are saying is mutually exclusive to what's in this resolution. I would hate to see us, I, I, I think that in, and Christine, please correct me if I'm wrong, but as you finalize the design based on a concept, which was the Thorpe concept, I, I, that might be an assumption, but that was my assumption from our last meeting in October when we discussed this, mm -hmm. that we would go forward um, with, to get that, that final design, which is, which was not finalized in Thorpe by any stretch of the imagination and get the cost estimates so that we could keep this train on the tracks as opposed to stopping the train or taking it, putting it on a whole different track again. I just, I just see us keep going backwards on this, on this um, initiative as opposed to moving forward. And I don't care, you know, to me, even if we move infinitesimally forward, that's better than just going backwards again. So I don't see where it's mutually exclusive what's in this resolution, um, but correct me if I'm wrong on that. No, I, I, there's part of, part of what has been going on from my, from my standpoint, what I've been involved in has been talking with, um, getting some input, informal input from architects that are experienced in the library world, including architects that have worked in Pikes Peak Library District. And there's, there's general consensus that we can take this, we can take the concepts to the next level. And um, so no, moving forward on this doesn't, it doesn't throw out the Thorpe concepts it doesn't throw out any of the thoughts and recommendations and suggestions that folks in the community have. Um, it, it just continues us on that, on that path that, that has been worked on um, with the idea that, that we move forward. So you're, you're right in that point. I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not sure what I can um, provide differently through a public process. A public process will cost tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and so by, uh, what I would, what I would like in this is to have cost estimates that, that give different options to us. Right. Um, we don't know what we can afford. I, I, I can't, you know, I can't say that, yes, we're taking, we have to take this to the voters. I don't know that. Um, I don't know that. Um, and to, until we get some, un, until we get a couple of different cost ideas um, and the fundraising as well. I don't think, I don't think there's, we're, in, we're not even close to final designs that we can um, take to anyone for fundraising or to grants. It's just trying to move that engine further down the tracks, if you will. Um, I have trains on my mind just coming from the, <laughs> well, I put <laughs> yeah, so, so we've just done such an extensive community process on this already. 
I, it's just, I get frustrated when we've got projects that go on for 20 years like this one has. And it's like every period, you know, every, you get a new council and you gotta start basically over again. And I, I just don't see the value in that. It's, it's, um, it's inefficient to say the least. So I would, I would like to get this resolution passed because to, as I interpret it, it makes a great deal of sense and um, it would be very useful to continue this project, to continue working on this project. So I see the issuing an RFP as being pretty important at this point as the next step. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Shada, would you, we haven't heard from Mr. Shada yet or Mr. Bremner. So John, what are your thoughts on this? Well, it sounds like to me there's some um, I understand Nancy's point, but this is the messy part of democracy, you know, and the section one clearly says the issuance of an RFP for final design and construction by a qualified firm. So I think the big question the council needs to ask is, are we, if, if, if this is based on the four ideas, okay, which appears to be so, which is what's all embedded in all these ordinances and resolutions by reference, okay, then we should be re we should be ready to go. But maybe we need to have the discussion about whether we're done with the process. Yes, I understand Nancy things take years and years and years and don't get done. Okay. But the reality of it is that's just life. And maybe we are not at the point to doing final design and construction costs. Okay, all right. Thank you, Mr. Shada. Um, Mr. Bremner? I, I have no comment. Oh, okay, all right. Um, Julie's hand was up, Mayor. I'm sorry, Julie, yeah. I was just going to say, I don't think it needs to spend tens of thousands of dollars for public input. I, I suppose one could spend tens of thousands of dollars without public input, but I'm not suggesting that we spend tens of thousands of dollars. I'm not even suggesting we hire one of those public input facilitators, which I'm not in favor of that stuff in generally in general, but um, I'm just saying have some public meetings to see in general, maybe even have people submit their drawings and have the, you know, the newspaper published, you know, the three most popular designs and see if people want to weigh in. You don't need to spend $20,000 for that. You don't need to hire somebody and have all those meetings. Um, but I, I don't, I, I'm not convinced that we're ready for final design. Uh, and, and, and I think that the, just to say, oh, we're going to do an RFP is, is very perplexing to me because I, I've read RFPs, I've drafted RFPs. How the heck? That's like saying, uh, gee, I'd like someone to build a house for me and uh, it's going to be somewhere in El Paso County and I, I'm not really sure how many square feet it will be or exactly which neighborhood, but you know, here's $50,000. Let me know if anybody wants to draw it for me. Well, come on, you need to decide certain basic things before you pay somebody to give you a final drawing. So that's why I'm personally backtracking um, on this. Thank you. Um, Question and Rob, I see your, your finger up, but I'm gonna ask, let me ask a question because you're the guy that is gonna probably respond to it. If we were to take the, the resolution as you proposed it last week, and if we just struck the part about asking, asking for an RFP at this point, um, I'm wondering how much that would, would that handicap you, a, handicap you a lot? I mean, that would still give us a little wiggle room to, to play with some of these other ideas, but it might give your group most of what you need so you can go out and continue your work. I mean, until we have two and a half million dollars figured out, it's kind of a, in a sense, it's academic. On the other hand, I also see you have to have plans to, to get a cost to. So Rob, if you'd make your comment and also if you could address my question, please. Uh, sure. Um, having a resolution passed tonight, as Nancy was saying, um, does keep us moving forward. 
we are on a momentum, uh, a progressive momentum, and by diverting, uh, like all the years past, we are just now at a standstill. And uh, we have a, a narrow window of time to get this done. And um, we need to start making progress. Um, and rather than being sidetracked, it's not to say that the counselors' um, thoughts on this and perspective is not to be um, considered. It's just that in the consideration, we need to continue to move forward. Um, and uh, we, our task force is a community-based task force for one. It's grassroots and we have um, a task force and a, a list of at least 50 people who have shown interest in the work that we're doing. We keep them updated monthly um, and some of them share with us their thoughts. Um, and so one of our subcommittees is a community outreach group where we will work with the city in developing uh, a, a channel of communication with the community. That was always our intention. Um, but to going back to your, um, your question, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, the first step was we need uh, a resolution so we can continue in the progress that we're making. That we, that you approve back on, in October uh, that we move in this direction, which we have. And we re, uh, ch uh, brought that back to you um, on the 8th of December. And from there, we've been moving forward in that same direction. Um, and so it's just, it's confusing, it's frustrating that yet we're being sidelined again. Uh, and when I say we, I'm talking about the we of 20, uh, 20 years of uh, involvement in this process. So um, that's how I feel. I would then turn it over to Christine to um, better address the notion of uh, deleting section one and trying to approve the rest, the remainder of the resolution. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Danny. Um, Christine, I think you've already kind of spoken to that, but if you'd like to add on to it. Sure, I, I, we, the RFP would, is trying to not, it's not just a, um, I have a, I appreciate your example, Councilor Wolf, um, you know, that I have a house somewhere in El Paso County. I'm not gonna be asking for those final construction costs until a design is settled on. Um, and the design is going to be um, considered, those, those architects, whoever that firm is, um, is going to receive what was put together as a part of the Thorpe process. Um, input from Pikes Peak Library District architects, um, as well as I have, I've only received one other um, set of proposed drawings. Um, and so those have actually already been forwarded on to, um, to those architects as well for, cons for just consideration. And so, um, you know, I think this is, it's not a, it's an all in one, it's, it's a, it's a process, and so we won't we won't come um, we won't come back with here's a final design and here's here's a construction cost Psh, vote on it. We but won't. that's where that's what the ordinance says, Christine. Then revise the ordinance because Good, Julie, the let let Christine finish, okay, please, and then we'll come back. Okay, sorry, Chris, Chris, <laughs> no, that's good. Christine, <laughs> mute myself. Please. Let, we'll let you finish your finish your thought there, and then. Sure, sure, no, no, no problem. Um, so, so what section one says is that planning staff move forward with the issuance of an RFP for final design, and construction cost development. It doesn't have to happen all in one step. That's not like when I'm working on a major project. There, there are a lot of um, designs that go into what the final looks like, and a lot of inputs. Um, so it says final design and construction cost development by a qualified firm, excuse me, using funds established. Um, so this doesn't, it doesn't take us to beginning construction. Um, it doesn't go into what the, you know, half dozen to a dozen steps are to get us to final design. And then from approval of final design to that construction cost development. I mean, it's a, 
it's it's a it's a phased process and and that's what i am intending for the rfp to clearly state is that this is a phased process they don't they don't get paid all in one lump sum um it's it's done by task and there are multiple tasks in this anticipated rfp to get at some of these exact concerns thank you uh, mayor uh, mayor pro tem had her hand up next i believe hey. Thank you. I'm just wondering if people would find would be more comfortable with the language that Mr. Todd does have in his um, under section one. So instead of saying final design um, and construction cost development, it simply says alternative designs and construction cost estimates. So take out that final and just just say alternatives. It. I said. Uh, yeah, Christine, you want to respond there? I didn't, in the conversation today, I didn't understand what what we're trying to get at with alternative. I'm not familiar. I, I'm sorry if I, hearkening back to the to conversation you guys had with Dole earlier, um, in the in the design world, I'm, I'm not familiar with the alternative being the primary. So if we had, um, if we had two designs in there, that would make more sense to me. Um, so I'm not sure what we're getting at there. And it would be very confusing um, to put together an RFP seeking just an alternative design. Under got it. Thank you. Just, just to be a devil's advocate, if we, in section one, if we just struck the word final design, does that give you a little more wiggle room to... I mean, to I mean, negotiate. It sounds like what you're proposing is an iterative process, which is pretty typical of an engineering and architectural process. You build a little, you think a little, you design, you you know, yes. you, you work you work through it. But but you're allowed to go forward. You're allowed to to make progress. Uh, so so I, you know, I, I, my my personal thought is, you know, I like the resolution pretty much the way it is. I, I don't think it's uh, that confining. I think it more. As I see it, this enables the library people to go out and pursue grants and pursue money and, and let us do some design work. I don't know that it hems us in and keeps us from going down a, a different path if we, if at some point we decided, and I say we as a community decided we can't come up with quite as much money as we need for the Thorpe design, then we, then the question is we we scale it back. How do we do that? I mean that's maybe the reality that we'll find ourselves in in, in nine months or a year or something like that. I'm, I'm just guessing. But I, I could see this as being actionable. I, I think the comments that people have made about postponing and, and getting a clear idea, idea I, I, I see that as also being valid, but a, I'm kind of anguished to think that you know, it's been 25 years since we first started thinking about making that, that building ADA compliant. And I, I don't want the library task force to lose momentum. I, I want the community to be able to to get something done, I'd like to see dirt turned in our lifetime and get it in. That's my two cents. Um, uh, Councilor Wolf, I think you have perhaps had your hand up. Did, or, okay, all right. Um, prepared to make a motion. Okay. Um, it, unless someone, well, people can still discuss it. I move that we approve resolution 3620, a resolution to affirm support for expansion of historical Carnegie Library building uh, with the amendment to section one, take out the word final. I would second that. Okay. I'll second. Okay, Good. Councilor Chandler, seconds. Okay, so we have a motion to second. Any further discussion? The motion then is to accept the, the resolution as presented with the one correction under section one, we would strike the word final out of that first sentence. Okay, you know, Councilor Wolf. We have to make sure Susan can vote. Okay, yeah, we'll just quick. Uh, hey, Julie, I'm here on the phone. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So that's can, fine. Perfect. Thank you, okay. Julie. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any any further discussion? Okay. Well, then let's go ahead and vote. All in favor of the motion, say aye. Raise your hand. Two, three, we have uh, five in favor. All opposed, say nay. Raise your hand, Julie. And then Susan, how do you say? Nay. Nay, okay, nay. so we have, um, 
resolution passes five to two um, with that one correction. Okay, thanks everybody. This is, you know, democracy is a slow process. We, we work through it, so thank you very much. And thank you. Uh, we'll take all of, all of the concerns and considerations under discussion, definitely. Um, but we appreciate you allowing us to continue in the momentum that we've been having in trying to get this thing done. So thank you. Go out and get two and a half, three million dollars. Okay, I'm on it. <laughs> thank you all. Okay, let's see, next business. Um, Okay, uh, an ordinance approving two loans from the Colorado Water Resources and Power Development Authority, authorizing the forms and execution of the loan agreements and governmental agency bonds to evidence such loans, authorizing the construction of two projects, prescribing other details in connection therewith, and declaring an emergency. And I guess I should probably explain, um, my understanding, this is an emergency ordinance, so it will um, it would need a unanimous vote and it would, uh, uh, it would just be, uh, there would not be a second hearing on this because it is an emergency. And my understanding is it's, we've got a, pay, uh, a timing issue. This needs to be done by the end of the year. So unless we wanted to have a special meeting um, and, and given the, um, the way the paper chain has gone, that's, that's kind of why, why we're in the situation we're in. On yeah. the other hand, I think it's fairly straightforward. Denise, did you want to add on to that? I was going to say, Jeff, Park, Jeff Parker, do you want to add to that or Becca of how we got to where we are and why we are here? I know Jeff and Becca has both been involved with that and why it's had to be an emergency. It, it may be better for Becca because I don't okay. have the, the full background leading up to this. But I mean, I think that ultimately it was the approval the process that took the, as much time. But I'll let Becca give the details. Right. And when their board met, et cetera. OK, sorry, no, right. I did not mean to interrupt. Okay, so this has been a very, very long process. Um, it all started back when we got our financial advisors beginning of the year. And then we met with them a few times to figure out how we wanted to finance our projects, our water sewer projects for the year. And we ultimately decided to go the route of what a lot, a lot of small cities do in Colorado. They go to the Colorado Water Resources and Power Development Authority and use their revolving loan program. It's uh, much more cost efficient than for us to, to uh, do a float a bond issue. There's a ton of work that involves in floating a bond issue and there's a, uh, you have to get uh, certifications and things and. Uh, ratings and stuff. So this was just the way that most small cities and towns do it in, in Colorado. And so that's why we did it. And I included uh, a document in here in the, your attachments about the state revolving phone uh, fund loan program. And it's just a two page document. The first page talks a bit about, about the program. And then the second page shows all the, I call them hoops that must be jumped through. And this was actually an easier process than floating bonds. But uh, when I referenced them as hoops to the Colorado Water Resources and Power Development people, they said, no, no, they're not hoops, they're, they're milestones. So um, we started back in, I believe it was May. It was May when we started this process. And we have now come trudging to the final conclusion. And we were actually uh, in November, we were told you've done everything you, you need to do. And then we were told we had to wait until December 4th because the board only meets once a month. And we had missed that time frame in November. So, and then they met on the 4th and they approved the loans. And the two loans, are for the one is going to be from the water fund and one is going to be from the sewer fund and they're 20 year loans i know in the actual loan uh, paperwork it says something along the lines of of um, uh, the verbiage is final maturity shall not be later than well it can be 
earlier than that. I mean, and the later than it was 25 years, but it can be earlier than that. And that's what it is in our case. The, the final maturity is actually in 2040. And the water loan is for uh, 8,000, excuse my reach here, $827,200. And the yearly payment will be $53,682.44. Then the sewer loan, which they call Water Pollution Control Revolving Fund, which is a mouthful, is uh, for $554,400. And it is going to be the yearly payment will be $35,978.66. And these are for the Clarksley Water, no, excuse me, the Clarksley Mountain View yeah. Road projects, which uh, we got a resolution from city council earlier in the year saying we go ahead and start the process of getting all that done because that whole process takes another lengthy time and if we waited until after we had the funding in place then it would still be six months from now before we you know get started on that now the reason why it's an emergency ordinance why we wanted it done in one day is because if it slides over into next year then we fall back on some of our milestones. And then the main one is uh, the TABOR requirement to prove that we are, that, that both these funds are enterprise funds, which can take on debt without going to a vote of the citizens. And so we didn't wanna have to now turn around and go back and prove that we are an enterprise fund. Because we, what we used was, uh, you have to use an, uh, years worth of data. So we went from like, uh, gosh, I guess May of 2019 to November of, of 2020, we use that data. And if we slide over into 2021, then we've got to turn around and we got to use from uh, <laughs> January of 2020 to December of 2020 if if we've gone over into a new year. So the whole point is to try not to have to jump back through hoops that we've already jumped through. And that's why we want to do this. And city council has over already approved the projects. And if you decide not to approve the the loans, what we would then have to turn around and do is use up a ton of the fund balance in these two funds to pay for these projects. And let me tell you, there is enough in those fund balances to pay for it, but then they would be really shrunk down and uh, we don't want to shrink those enterprise fund balances down lower than the necessary. This is not that that wasn't the plan. The plan was to, uh, was to get loans on these. And so that's what we're doing now. Any questions? Yes. Julie, uh, Councillor Wolf. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Becca. I'm just, uh, for my own education, and thank you for working on all of this. Um, um, or maybe this is a Jeff Parker question. Uh, can we just do this anytime we want to call something an emergency, then we can just do it? Or what? what is the criteria for Manitou to circumvent the normal process and declare an emergency. Is there any guidelines and are we within those guidelines? Yeah, I'd like to there, let Jeff there, to this. Okay, yeah, there's, there's, there's no set guidelines. It's generally a legislative determination by city council. It's, it's given deference. Your, your determination what's an emergency, what's not is given deference by the courts. Um, you know, ultimately it, it can't be a sham. It, it can't be something that, um, uh, you know, is, is basically shown to be intended to circumvent, you know, the, the standard regular ordinance readings. But uh, you know, a lot of things can be an emergency and economic uh, issues can be an emergency as well, um, like include, including losing out on good loan rates, uh, et cetera. So, I mean, so, yeah. Thank you very much. 
You're welcome. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I would like to just speak about the project and the importance of the project. It's um, I've been in that neighborhood. It is in my ward. It's the number one um, capital improvement project for um, water and sewer. Um, we have had lots of payouts, insurance payouts, as a result of people's basements and um, so on constantly being flooded with sewage. Um, I, I've seen it, it's horrible. Um, it was a mistake that the city made at installing this many years ago, and it absolutely needs to be corrected. So, uh, you know, I, it's, it, and I know we've been working on this and staff's not we, the staff has been working on it. However, we did raise um, last year in the last council, we did raise the water rates in order to be able to do things like this. Um, so I would just really encourage us to um, move forward on this and um, I'd be prepared to make a motion, but I, I don't want to do that until I feel pretty good about um, that we're going to get a unanimous vote on. <laughs> so I'd like any discussion, any concerns that people might have first. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Chandler, please. So I guess my first question is, is this a typical situation? Can, do we have any precedent for this happening before as an emergency or is this, is this uh, uh, not typical, typical that we, so, um, could, and, and, I, and I address this to Jeff Parker, um, I guess my concern is we, you know, this is an emergency and we need a unanimous vote and it's an important thing, but is there precedent? Uh, you know, know, I, 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 can't, I can't recall if the city has had an emergency ordinance um, adopted for a financial reason. I can say that other clients of our firm have made similar findings um, in the past that you know, losing out on good rates, losing out on loans that you may not get in the future is an emergency. Um, what I usually don't like to declare an emergency is something that could have been avoided um, if people had basically done things properly. My understanding in this case is that this really wasn't any delay on the city's part. It was just a function of when the funds became available and when things got reviewed. So uh, I can say that I'm relatively comfortable. This is um, meets, the, meets the criteria for an emergency, provided that you all agree because your decision is given deference. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilor Wolf. Oh, I just want to say it's a great interest rate. I'd love to finance all my debt at this rate. Uh, it's a great interest rate and it's an essential need. And as much as people in the community that might be listening might think, oh my gosh, you're going to spend that much money on someone else's neighborhood. Um, the truth is, and I think it was mentioned, it's expensive for the city to keep paying our own staff to constantly repair things that break and you just have to go piecemeal rather than getting the job done right. So I, I, I'm comfortable with this and I think, uh, you know, thank goodness there's such a great low interest rate that we can, I assume it's a fixed rate uh, loan was my understanding. Uh, is that correct? Yeah. That is correct. So yeah, I mean, geez, how much lower can you get? Uh, so I think it's fabulous. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Um, any other councillors with comments? I, I guess I'll mention that, you know, a number of years ago, I was at a city council meeting for some, it was some other reason, but I remember an individual got up and he lives on Clarksley and he was in front of council complaining that it was something like the second or third time he'd had sewage flooding oh. into his basement. And, oh. and, uh, and, and it cost the city some money to get that cleaned up. And it's it, certainly this would meet his de that guy's definition of an emergency. And if it was your basement, <laughs> it would it would definitely be an emergency. I, I think it's in uh, and, and, and city staff had anticipated um, this whole process. I think it was premeditated. Uh, it was well organized. It was planned. There were a couple of um, delays that they, they were external. And so in that sense, uh, I think the city staff acted very responsibly and with, with good insight and, and with good um, 
with good vision on this. And I think we, I think we legitimately meet the, the full definition of emergency. I'm not a lawyer, but I, I know what it's like to have your basement full of sewage. So um, anyway, it's my two cents. Uh, Councillor Chandler. I'd like to proceed to call a question and vote. Thank you. I'll make a motion first, if that's okay. <laughs> I think we need oh. to make a motion before we yeah, call the question. Yeah, Sorry, okay. Mayor Brookham, I, I do that. Sorry. No problem. I appreciate it because it does get, it does. Anyway, um, I move to approve ordinance number 1620, an ordinance approving two loans from the Colorado Water Resources and Power Development Authority, authorizing the forms, the execution of loan agreements and governmental agency bond to evidence such loans, authorizing the construction of two projects, prescribing other details in connection therewith, and declaring an emergency. We have a second? Second. Councilor Chandler, second. So we have a motion and a second. If there's no further discussion, let's vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Okay, what about Susan? Susan, oh, so, aye. Susan. Susan, aye. how did you, what did you, how did you vote? <laughs> She said I. I got I. Okay. He Thank said I four times, so she voted four times. Hey, okay. well, that makes it really unanimous. Okay. That's All great. right, great. Th Thank you very much. Okay, uh, coming to the home stretch here. Time to receive or act on council correspondence. Does anybody have anything? Mayor, I have. This is Susan Walbrook. I have um, one question. Um, I've received some questions about the five star program that the state's working on and I know that they're working on that program to certify businesses to be open if they pass certain restrictions. I believe Mesa County may be the county that they're going to test that in. Um, but are we obviously my, the question is will we will we move to do that and will that require city council to approve that is the question that I got uh, about that. And the second question I got is, I'm assuming we are at still, I, we're still at the red level and it doesn't look like that's gonna break any differently based on the numbers. And I just, I figured that the, maybe in, even in their city administrative reports, um, Denise or Roy could maybe address that, uh, both of those questions. So if they're gonna address them in the city administrative report, we can just wait. Denise is nodding here. So I take that as a, an affirmative response. Okay. Uh, did you have any, okay, so we'll get that answer for you. Um, Susan, did you have anything else? Nope, that's it, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Oh. Councilor Wolf? Do we have a lien on that property, Jeff, at Pawnee? Um, the answer, oh, I just looked at that issue. I'm sorry, I want to- That's um, okay, I, I didn't mean to spring it on you, but I'm really concerned. We just, Jeff, do you, I'll, yeah, go I ahead, Denise, if you have. Yeah, I've letter. Uh, go ahead, Becca, you can respond. I've written a letter. I've got all the invoices together. I have verified there's not going to be any more invoices. I'm coming into the office tomorrow. In addition to getting the loan documents printed, I am mailing the letter, the official letter to the uh, owner along with the invoices. And then I'm going to notify Jeff's office which starts the countdown to getting the lien on. Yeah, so the way that your code reads is that um, the lien basically arises when the payment is 30 days, when, the, when payment has not been made within 30 days of the oh. notice of the bill. But right. I'm our, I wanna argue a little differently that, um, that there is notice of the cleanup there was an abatement notice that was basically filed against the property so i think people will be given anybody trying to buy the property should have notice that there's an issue and there's potential for um a charge to arise oh and the the abatement notice is filed with the clerk and recorder I, my, I think that it was i think we i asked that question last meeting i need to basically verify well, that I well, yeah, because in the last meeting I asked and I got a very nebulous answer because if it hasn't been filed with the clerk and recorder, then a bona fide purchaser has a defense to the lien. And I tried to ask you about that last time and you misunderstood my question and, and answered something else. Uh, but I'm just mm -hmm. concerned if there's a bona fide purchaser that isn't on actual notice under real estate law, isn't that a problem? I mean, I'm not a real estate lawyer, but you know, it's kind of basic. 
Yeah, although uh, city 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 costs can be different than actually recording it, it, instruments. Maybe we could look at this. I can discuss it with you offline tomorrow because um, I don't want to go into well, details. I, okay, and, and here's here's the reason I haven't asked you about it, Jeff. I don't want to incur expense for the city to answer my question. It's much more cost effective just to get it done. Yep. So if we've already, you know, if we have to wait another 30 days during the um, waiting period from the notice that Beck is going to send out, then can you just, I mean, I don't want to be accused of directing staff, but I want there to be something filed with the clerk and recorder's office to put a, uh, you know, BFP on notice, a bona fide purchaser. Yeah, so so here, actually, it's a great point. I'm looking back at my con my conversations with Rebecca uh, from a few days ago. And so what, what I, I had directed to happen is that the, the actual letter with the amount that's owed be recorded. So the letter that that's she's working on. Idea. Yeah, and I apologize. I kind of I forgot think. the timing of everything when you asked me the question. I just wasn't ready oh. to answer it. So, so that'll be recorded once it's done, which is, I think Rebecca's working on, she says tomorrow. And then we'll still have the 30 days for the official lien to, to uh, attach to the property pursuant to your code, but there will be the notice. Recorded. Oh, and then we'll be protected right away. That would yeah. be great. Yeah. Thank you. No, and the welcome. other issue I had, Mayor, was um, I recall that um, we were told that we have to have something in by Christmas to Mountain Metro regarding any um, public discussion. And I was left, uh, frankly, a little confused. I mean, the sense I had at first was if we want changes, we have to let them know by Christmas. And then it was like, oh, unless it's a teeny weeny weeny little tiny change, forget it. You got to wait until six more months or something. So I, I wasn't really clear on that, but I would really like to be some public process on the um, importance and frequency of use of um, shuttle 33 after 6 p.m. And I, and I, and I want to see if that's just a waste of pollution and a waste of money. And I don't care if it's Colorado Springs that's wasting their money. If, if they refuse to give us money to help pay the shuttle other than when nobody uses it, then they can just use that money for their own general fund. Um, but I'd like that to be added. And I didn't know if, if there was clear direction to staff on that issue at the end of our last meeting. You're muted, uh, Mayor. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Uh, yeah, as, as I recall, we, we did discuss that uh, last week, that six to eight o'clock window. Um, and and, and uh, Mr. Batuli, he had, I, I think he said they were constrained by the agreement, the existing agreement. And the existing agreement expires on New Year's Eve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought that's what he said. Aren't we, we're looking, our five year contract ends the end of December, and there's some kind of mandatory public process that happens in January. And I'm not clear about that either, but. Um, I do remember if we wanted changes, we had to bring it up to them by, at first he said December, and then Denise wisely asked, can you be more precise? And he said before Christmas. So I'd like there to be public, con I'd like that to be included uh, with the other things that we had discussed, which I think was uncontroversial, uh, having to do with the bus going either down to Serpentine if we're not worried about construction, we're only going down to the Ruxton turnabout if there is concern about construction. And there seemed to be a difference of opinion on that issue. But I just wanted to get clarity because I think this is our last meeting before Christmas. So I want to know, I want to make sure that Denise is, is clear on what we're asking her to do. So let me reach out to Brian. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Barely. Uh, can you hear me now? That's a little better, yeah. I'll try to scream again, sorry. Um, <laughs> okay. I'll reach out to Brian tomorrow, make sure that he has exactly what questions, and then I'll forward those to you, to all of council, to, to say what he, what he thought we were asking, 
and then I'll make sure that this is part of that question. So I'll try to get that forwarded to you by Friday. It may take me a couple of days to get back for Brian to get back with me, but I'll follow up with, uh, with all of council on an email on that one. Well, thank you so much. Okay. All right. Great. That's all I have. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Um, Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah. Just addressing Julie's question. Um, my understanding and I thought I had it pretty clearly was that the only thing we could address in public process was going to serpentine in the January timeframe and that our other questions of which there were numerous ones but we first needed data that Roy was going to go get us on the various um, yeah. how many riders where they were getting off how much things were costing and really put it together for us so that we could determine what questions we wanted to ask. And then we also talked about having a one-year contract instead of a five-year contract so that we could potentially, hopefully, participate in the second public process of the year. So that's what I took away as I believe what we, the guidance we had provided, albeit it was very um, complicated discussion. Oh, thank you, Nancy. May I just ask you one clarification, Nancy? It was my understanding also that there was some dispute about whether it makes sense for the bus, whether it's safe for the bus to go down to Serpentine. Yes, Dole was going to let us know about um, if it would conflict with the MAPS project, the construction in the MAPS project. So Dole's so Dole will make that decision and then that's what will be submitted for the public process? I, I can't tell you the answer to that. My sense was is that he was going to come back and let us, let us, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer. That's a great question, Julie. I, I don't think we're going to defer to Denise. Before, we won't so, see you before Christmas. So let me get all this um, and I'll send it out on Friday. And then if you have a question, give me a call or if there's something else so we can talk about it off, offline. But let me get with Brian because Roy is off. So let me get with Brian and make sure I understand exactly what questions Roy submitted to him. And then also, Denise, as a follow-up, is Roy, do you believe, is he still, is that still on his agenda to get back with us next year early on about, because mm -hmm. he said he had that data in his office or that he'd already collected the data. It was just a matter of providing it to us. I know he and Dole were working on it, and I have not seen it at this point. I know that they were working on it, but I have not seen any of the numbers yet. But it's already collected, is that yeah, right? Yeah, but they had to do some analysis with it. And so oh, I have okay. not seen that at this point. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank you. Um, any of the other council members, do you have anything to report? Okay, I guess not. Um, one thing that I do have is uh, in January, we'll be looking at council um, uh, liaison assignments. So in the next day or two, I'll send you out a a list of the, the uh, well, a copy of the resolution that we adopted last January, so you'll know who's doing what. Um, if you want to make a change or something, that would probably be a good idea to get a little bit of thought to that. Um, I know uh, Mayor Pro Tem Fortune is on quite a number of boards, and I believe she would uh, encourage someone else to do the Fountain Creek uh, watershed uh, um, service. So if, if anyone has bandwidth to do that, that would be, uh, I think she would appreciate that. Anyway, we'll give that a little bit of thought and we'll come back to that idea in January. That's all I've got. Um, let's move on then to the city administrator's report. Mr. Cheney is off this week and next week. And so it's on you, Denise. Okay. Just a couple of quick things is um, regarding the work on um, Manitou Avenue, the gas line, I wanted to let you know that 1,100 feet have been, been installed. 700 feet is waiting on the road to be installed. And then after that is installed, um, it will be uh, on hold until the springtime. So that one thing that they will do is they'll do some cold patch repair throughout the winter. And then after the winter comes, then they'll repair that um, the avenue accordingly. So just wanted to share that, that that is moving. <coughs> Regarding the um, five-star program, Susan, we I'm working with Leslie on that to see what that will take and how quickly it could happen. So we're in those conversations also I want to let you know that I, I know that the city of Carroll Springs and the um, county has approved the tax refund and we're looking at how we could do something like that here and I hope to get an email out to you. I was writing it today but I have not gotten it out 
feedback. I was sending me some stuff. So I hope to get an email out to you tomorrow of instead of that, maybe that 50,000 that we used um, for loans, maybe do some type of grants. So we're working with the chamber on that and it's the chamber money instead of doing a refund because we have a lot of restaurants that are needing money right now. So I will be following up with an email to all of you with that once we kind of put that together and um, get that out to you. So those are the things that we're really working on at this point as we finish up the year. And as always, I wanna say happy holidays to all of you and your family and to everybody in Manitou and um, hope you enjoy the holidays. So thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Well, with that, I will say happy holidays, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, happy new year. I hope everybody has a good next two weeks and you get a chance to relax and spend time with your family. So we'll see you next year, okay? Thank Thanks. You, John. Merry good Christmas. Time. Great Merry to work Christmas. with you guys here. Happy holidays. Good job. good job, everybody. Good meeting. Thanks.